Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Multnomah County Commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Myron is joining us virtually today. Um, audience members, I want to start by asking you to please silence your electronic devices. I would also like to remind people that in addition to the people in this room, we have people watching online and listening online. So please consider your language in comments and testimony today. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. And for all presenters, please remember to state your name for the record before speaking or responding to questions. May I have a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Commissioner uh, Jayapal moves. Commissioner Brim Edwards seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye. The consent calendar is approved. Opportunity for public comment on non agenda matters. This is a time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you or call you to the presenter's table. I will set a timer for two minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up, at which point please wrap up your sentence. We received 14 verbal testimony and three written testimony, which was shared with board members and staff. We're going to do virtual testimony first. Um, which is going to be Chinoa Landry. Um, Chinoa, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and begin. I guess I'll request to unmute you. Um, Chinoa, I've sent a, a unmute request but I don't see that you've responded. So I'm gonna uh, move to the next person and we can circle back around. Um, Bree Condon. Bree Condon, you can unmute yourself and begin. Can everybody hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. My name is Bree Condon. I currently serve as the executive director at Bradley Angle. And the public testimony I would like to offer the board today is this. Voter approved tax measures, such as the supportive housing services measure, were designed to enable agencies like Bradley Angle to address root cause issues of homelessness. In a recent point in time count completed by the county, it uncovered that 53% of women on our streets experiencing houselessness have experienced domestic violence. The best solutions embedded in this budget amendment being deliberated on today will be crafted when we are all viewing the problem as clearly as possible, not viewing the issues through mud. For example, Bradley Angle has been accountable to numerous audits that occur every 12 months and our data has been consistently collected and reported on to county agencies. The issue of whether or not community-based service providers such as Bradley Angle should be made to report further outcomes before we receive additional wage allocations is an uninformed narrative. Speaking for my agency, we do submit numerous outcome measurements, progress reports, and data sets to all of our funders throughout the year. To make things even clearer on this point, our request to receive just contracts that pay a living wage for direct service workers is not to somehow get out of reporting data to the joint office. We do report plenty of data consistently and on time to the Joint Office of Homeless Services. We have a workforce problem stemming from too much work for too little pay. It is evident in public safety arenas, in courthouses, and in social service agencies. The most recent 3% increase for staff approved by the chair, thank you very much, resulted in $19,446 more dollars to our JAWS contract spread across direct service teams. Did we receive a full 3% increase? No, we did not. Was this enough to offer a living wage to direct service staff? No, it was not. Prior to the pandemic, direct service staff Time. were commonly referred to as FTE, and now we are referring to them as essential. I urge a yes vote on further extension of funds in this budget amendment so that we can, as providers, retain and hire experienced staff as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Um, next, we have uh, Danae Shakuma. Uh, 
Danae, you can um, unmute yourself and begin. Hey there, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Hi, my name is Danae Sakuma. I'm a second generation descendant of the Walla Walla tribe and an architect that has had the privilege of working with the FGC and Barbie's Village. So that's what I wanted to share about today. Um, just to give a little bit of context for the process of how I've been involved back in 2019, I reached out to Jolene with FGC because I'd heard a rumor that she had some big project in mind. And my firm, Henneberry Eddy, has an annual community service scholarship that I wanted to use to benefit the Native community in Portland in some way. And after hearing Jolene speak, it was obvious she had this huge vision already worked out, but it was all up here. So what I was able to help with through this scholarship was to start visualizing that dream and putting it on paper. But it wasn't just Jolene and me dreaming that. We asked members of the Native community to participate in a workshop, focusing on those who have already experienced houselessness. So that feedback helped to establish the architectural program and concept for the village, which we laid out on the hypothetical site since we didn't have land yet. So the design concept for this village, which I know you've already heard a bit about, is, is based around a cedar tree which is an important indigenous symbol, symbol in the Pacific Northwest with the idea that each layer has a different role that it plays. So this, this village is doing more than just housing people. It's creating stability with spiritual and community gathering places. It has layers dedicated to growth through the, the wellness services um, for mental nourishment and the communal garden and kitchens for physical nourishment. And then finally, on, on this outer layer, the bark, it's helping to create a safe shelter that protects that growth and stability of, of the future um, inhabitants of the village. So uh, that's, that's the overall design concept. And, and with that information that we took and gathered from the community, we put in, it into a report. We got an initial cost estimate from DCW cost management. And from there, it's kind of taken on a life Time. of its own. So um, we're next steps is just creating design and construction documents for the homes. And we have a team all set to go on that. So that's been our process thus far. Next, we have Natalyn Begay. Natalyn, you must you <coughs> may unmute yourself and begin. Hi, can you hear me all? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for uh, bringing me in the space. My name is Natalyn Begay. You she and her pronouns. Um, I am a citizen of the Diné Nation, and currently I serve as the policy mode lead with the Future Generations Collaborative. I come to you this morning to talk to you about some of the um, budget needs of uh, the Future Generations project, um, which you all know as Barbie's Village. Uh, in our request, in our budget request, we did um, request some renovations that are very much needed in the building um, where Barbie's Village is going to be housed. Uh, one of those needs, um, a lot of those needs actually are um, critical to early childhood programming, to the tiny home village, and some of those needs include our um, furnaces and air conditioning uh, for the building. Currently, they're, they are out, and uh, we can't actually inhabit the building um, when it gets cold uh, in the in the winter time. So those are some critical needs that are in the budget um, uh, for Barbie's Village. We also have some uh, challenges around. Um, we recently lost our refrigerator that that actually is in our um, in our kitchen and um, many of the appliances that are in the kitchen right now are from the 1970s so that those definitely need to be um, replaced um, in addition to some of the reserva renovations our flooring needs those also need to be renovated as most of those um, uh, the flooring is from the original um, building in the 70s. Um, many of these, like I said, many of these renovations are critical to early childhood programming and the services that, um, not only the services that the kitchen will provide will be part of the wraparound services to the families who are Hi. living at Barbie's Village, um, but also essential to those programs that are um, using that space, such as the early childhood, um, oh, Help Me Natalie, Grow, which is- Your time is up. Okay, and so I just urge you all to um, 
consider the full budget for Barbie's Village. Thank you so much for your time. All right, that's all we have <clears throat> virtually. So we'll move to in-person. Uh, we have Richard Perkins, Ann Pernick, Ann Turner, and Dion Salazar. Good morning, you can begin. Morning, I'm Dick Perkins, commissioners. When voters approved the supportive housing tax on wealthier households and high revenue businesses, they gave the county 10 years to end homelessness. We have seven left, but those high income households and high revenue businesses are leaving the county, as you know, Chair. Voters approved Measure 110 to fund treatment for substance use disorder. Now we have a fentanyl and meth crisis on our streets and more people are overdosing than getting treatment. You, Chair, are responsible for the county's behavioral health and housing plans. Things are getting worse. There is no behavioral health plan and we have no by-person data system so we can accurately scale resources to address the need. Because of these failures, the governor has convened a task force to save the city's largest city. Chair, you sit on that task force. Yesterday, Portland unanim unanimously passed an ordinance banning public use of hard drugs in anticipation of the February special session, which will amend Measure 110 to create an involuntary path to treatment for those with substance use disorder. That will save many lives, but only if we have the treatment resources. It appears that everyone but the County Board of Commissioners understands the urgency of the moment. You have an opportunity today with Crown Plaza and Bybee Lakes to take a positive step forward. Please don't fail the people of Multnomah County. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Chair, Commissioners, and staff. My name is Ann Pernick, and I'm with Safe Cities at Stand Out Earth. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here with advocates from Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility and 350PDX, and we're the Anns. You'll hear from <laughs> Dr. Ann Turner in a moment. Uh, we're here to give you this climate emergency kit. We've got clear signs of the climate emergency all around. We have extreme heat. We have intensifying wildfires. The problem is clear fossil fuels, which are a clear threat to our climate and to our local health and safety. The solutions are in this kit. In, in, in here is the report from the county's health department on the dangers of gas stoves, the gas report that was put together by many local advocates, and a safe cities policy binder with information about many different policies to phase out fossil fuels at the local level, including building electrification, which we hope you'll move forward on immediately. My fellow advocate, Dr. Ann Turner, is going to be adding some more materials into the kit in a moment. And after she speaks, we hope you'll accept the kit and move forward on building electrification immediately. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Ann Turner. And first, I want to thank you for bringing a suit against the oil industry for their responsibility in our current climate catastrophe. As you know, all fossil fuel industries, including the gas industry, are responsible for the mess that we are currently in. So as a physician and a member of Oregon's Physicians for Social Responsibility, I want to focus on the problem of the health harms of indoor air pollution caused by gas stoves and ovens and add a few items to the toolkit in, in this bucket. The first is a, is a letter that Oregon PSR has uh, written urging you to take the next step after your excellent report to address this critical health issue. A few facts from this document. Gas stoves emit the same pollutants as car exhaust, including nitrogen dioxide, which the EPA has found causal of asthma, especially in children. And gas stoves leak methane, even when they're off. And that leaked methane is contaminated with benzene, a known cause of blood cancers. 
but I'm also adding several prescriptions from health professionals to you, Multnomah County, as our health authority urging you to act. From Dr. Joseph Stenger, gas stoves are a health hazard. It's time to phase them out. I urge you to take definitive action to rapidly eliminate this risk from homes in our county. From Dr. Patricia Kahlberg, gas stoves in the home are a danger to child health and the children most at risk due to poor ventilation and poorly maintained appliances are poor kids and kids of color. Gas stoves are a driver of the plague of childhood asthma. This is an issue of climate justice. And from Catherine Bax, a physician assistant, asking you to please explore Multnomah County's authority under the state and federal laws to regulate gas appliances based on, a ba on an emissions-based approach. So Oregon PSR supports you as the county health authority in taking the next step Thank to you. address this important health and environmental issue. Thank you. Thank you. And we hope you'll accept this bucket. Yes. Is it okay to bring the bucket? You can pr provide it to the board clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to um, go back to Chinoa Landry. Um, Chinoa, you can unmute yourself and begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shanoa Landry. I'm a member of the Pialat tribe, and I'm also a, uh, I'm she, her, and I'm also a community health worker with Native Wellness Institute. We're part of the Future Generations Collaborative, and I just wanted to share today a little bit about um, our, our role as community health workers. Um, I'm really honored to be able to speak on behalf of the community health worker team um, here today. We are um, part of a collaborative, um, including a lot of the the native uh, nonprofit and organizations in the Portland area. Um, community health work has been around since time immemorial. We, we serve as sort of a liaison between the um, health professionals and community members. We represent our community, so we are also members of the community. Um, and um, this this group this work has also grown in the over the past decade or so with the Future Generations Collaborative. We we had um, elders and natural helpers do community health worker training about ten years ago, and uh, since the pandemic has gone. Our work has only grown. Um, having a space to be able to have a um, cross cross program work has been really, really beneficial beneficial for our community. Um, it's given our community a lot of hope. Um, we we provide we've provided life saving services such as um, providing masks, tests, testing, um, and um, uh, hand sanitizer, basic needs such as food and uh, clothing and um, shelter is also a, a home is also a basic need that a lot of our community experiences higher rates of houselessness. We don't say homeless because these are our homelands and we've time. resided here since time. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the space. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have in person Susie Kirshner, Charles Bridge Crane Johnson, Steve Herring, um, and Aaliyah Mays. Good morning. Who's ever ready can begin. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Aaliyah Mays. Uh, I reside in Old Town Chinatown. Um, so here's where we're at. TriMet cleared a couple of yards of the large camp that is underneath the steel bridge, which is considered what the pit. That's what you guys are all calling it. Um, we have a problem because they just moved across to the bigger portion. The people that were in that couple of yards just moved to the bigger portion. Um, and now we have another problem with a camp that's being built now directly across the street from us in a public property that is vacant and has a fence around it. Right now there's about 15 uh, tents. I 
got it. You guys have got to figure out another way to do what you're doing because the reporting and waiting till these camps get to uh, an enormous amount of people is an absolute failure. We need to nip it in the butt before it gets to that point to where it's unmanageable. That's exactly what happened in a lot of our neighborhoods. And I have to say that I am concerned about, uh, I know that there are developers that are very interested in the McCormick Pier area property. And I'm concerned that this is being intentionally done the failures to tear these camps down and allowing them to grow and thrive in our neighborhood. And then I'm watching Echelon uh, security guards because they guard the yards, they guard the projects over across the street, and we hired them also. People are parking in our parking lot to go buy drugs across the street. I. And I'm familiar with these kinds of things. I grew up in Northeast North Portland during the crack epidemic. I am not unfamiliar. I need people around me to recognize what they're seeing and do something about it before we're pushed out of our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Steve Herring, and I'm the CEO of Living Room Theaters here again. 120 seconds here is tough to communicate uh, a, a widespread of issues that address uh, what the county is facing. Downtown and overall Multnomah County's public safety conditions are worse today than they were on January 1st, 2023. Our business no longer has 9 p.m. movies because there's no one who wants to come downtown and no one who lives downtown that feels safe to come out after dark. These are interconnected, complex problems. It's not just a housing problem, it's not just a substance use disorder problem, it's not just a mental health problem, but you have a collection of services that you all oversee. And I want to specifically come to this thing, we've talked about plans and different ideas, but what, what we need from you, the executive leadership of this county, is a vision, a vision for how to tackle these problems. You, you've been, you know, many people have sat here and criticized about the chair's plan to fine AMR for their performance. And I would argue that that, again, is a complex set of problems. Yesterday at the Portland City Council meeting, there was a gentleman who was an official from Portland Fire and Rescue in the downtown Old Town station. And he communicated that, that, that just a recent past weekend, they had experienced 70 Narcan overdose recoveries in a single weekend, 300 on average every month. Those public safety officials are growing tired of going back to the same problem day after day that doesn't get better. So you're losing public safety officials in a situation just from that one problem, and it's the same problem for AMR. While they're responding to recover one person who's Narcan and two hours later is back in the same place, they're not responding to a heart attack victim or someone else throughout the county. We need to address these problems systematically and as one. And I, I urge you all to please put politics aside and work together. You're all very smart, and I think you can do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's my privilege, my pleasure, and uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak on behalf of this issue. Uh, I am extremely grateful to you as a board for the focus and the and would you just mind st stating your name for the record? I'm sorry, and I have had no manners whatsoever. <laughs> Nechmeitsky, Chair Megan Vanderson, and commissioners, and thank you. And my name is Susie Kirshner, and I am currently uh, the mode lead for the Future Generations Collaborative. It's been my privilege to be bar with a part of this cooperative since its inception. Uh, but what I'm really here to do is to express gratitude for the lands of the traditional peoples uh, where we are. Uh, and in so speaking, focusing our attention on the indigenous community uh, of the Portland uh, metro area and responding with a uh, reinforcement and uh, support for the development of Barbie's Village within the context of the FGC project that you've heard le both last week and this week. And so uh, when I mention the traditional lands of the peoples here, uh, I also mention the fact that it is this Mult Multnomah being one of the, one of the um, 
uh, peoples, uh, this is a traditional site of gathering and for, res and for resolution. So I think it's timely, I think it's appropriate, uh, I think it's interesting to find myself you know, looking at the solution from the perspective that might look like political differences, but I really think that we have in common the co outcome of healthy families and healthy children. And so um, I, I, I think as, as law, and, and this, is, this is what you are charged with as the commissioners, this is what you are dedicating your time and your spirit to, and I am grateful because yes, you have a pot of money. There are many deserving people, people for this. Um, so I want to encur you. encourage to look at the, in terms of the Child Development Center uh, that is at the core of this and some things that we've provided in terms of that. Thank you so much for today. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as you all might be familiar with, I am Bridge Crane, uh, Charles Simka Johnson, and uh, it's good to be here as a little bit of a cross-pollination and dialogue continues. Yesterday at City Council, uh, there was testimony from Commissioner Sharon Myron and today here in the county chambers, we have a city councilor. We don't need to call them city commissioners anymore because that language is going away. There'll be no more city commissioners. There'll be councilors. And uh, Renee Gonzalez is with us. And unfortunately, um, we have to wait till we get to R1 to find out how we get 40 minutes of information about $17.69 million. Uh, when we try to prepare for these meetings and we go on the web, there's two pages of nothingness that's sort of a landscape mode presentation spreadsheet. Uh, and even in the little summary here, uh, we find out that Metro, which skims off 5% of the SHS money, has given us or consensually built with us a corrective action plan and uh, the short title doesn't tell us whether that 17, 16 million dollars goes to backfill uh, along with the underspend or whether it's part of the unanticipated revenue. So uh, we seem to be getting more confusion than progress, uh, but I'm sure you'll have some sharp questions I'll hopefully clarify for that uh, for all your constituents, including the presumably 6,000 people that are unhoused and as Ms. Condon noted, uh, a long-running nonprofit that replies to audits and does their best to inform you to, as they seek to serve the 53% of women experiencing homelessness who've encountered domestic violence. Um, they really need some money to retain staff and grow the programs to meet the needs. So it'll be interesting to see what we do for 40 minutes on R1. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Gerard Mildner, Dan Salazar, and Lightning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is good morning. My name is Jerry Milner. I'm a retired PSU professor. I volunteer with the Revitalized Portland Coalition, which is a group of real estate. Uh, organizations in town. Uh, I, I'd like to speak to the, the homelessness issue, and I, I continue to think that the county needs to maintain a by named list of the homeless individuals living on our streets so that they can provide more individualized care. Uh, you, as the county commissioners, uh, are the health authority for the Portland Gresham area, uh, and like any doctor, <laughs> you ought to keep notes on your patients. And so I think that by name list needs to include. Uh, uh, name, uh, social security number, next of kin, f uh, former work history. I think the, these folks have the potential for rehabilitation, but also any kind of notes you have about uh, drug use, alcohol abuse, uh, and mental illness to the extent that that's diagnosed. And uh, towards that end, I think you, the, the issues are, that are on the table today to think about uh, funding the Bybee Lakes uh, Recovery Center, the Hope Recovery Center, and then also the Crown Plaza Hotel uh, as a possible place to rehabilitate the homeless. I think that would fit in well with collecting that kind of data and also asking the organizations that are contracted with you also to collect that kind of data, obviously in some kind of you know, privileged and confidential way, but in a way so that the providers know what the background is of the individual uh, that they're meeting with. Thank you. Good morning. 
Good morning, my name is Dean Salazar and I uh, am a resident of East Portland and I also serve on the Oregon Commission on Autism as a co-chair of the Social Services and Adult Support Subcommittee. In which uh, context uh, I have seen information regarding the large amount of people who are likely part of the homeless population uh, and not only is that uh, a major problem, but we are also aware of uh, them not getting the proper mental health care support that they need before they get before they go uh, houseless, and of course during as well. And it, I've also lived here for 12 years. Uh, when I first moved here when I was uh, 11 years old, there was uh, there I saw a good degree of ho houselessness and homelessness, which. Uh, depressed me and 12 years later uh, no matter who was in charge uh, we are seeing this problem worsen and uh, in this in these times we keep hearing about the disorder and the joint con co uh, joint office of homeless services uh, and uh, more and let me be clear that's not leadership we need good leadership and we need good government we need to be able to hold uh, the county uh, officials accountable so that we can have a more timely reporting uh, as well as more accessibility and transparency so that we can move forward better as part of a county and so that we can all work together. We've seen uh, the correction action plan, uh, Metro and uh, squabbling and enough is enough. We need to get on this all together as a coalition and we need more transparency and less centralization in my opinion. And we also need to ensure that we are able to solve this problem within five years. This is a crisis, the crisis of our time in Portland, and we need to rise to it. Our future is better than this, and I stand by that wholeheartedly. That's why I ask for you to seriously consider uh, performing the Joint County uh, Office of Homeless Services. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Humanity X. The death list, which we saw in the Willamette Week, on all the empty and unwanted buildings, the iconic buildings, as you know, 15 have basically been handed back to the banks, gone into foreclosure, been auctioned off. We have another 20 to 30 in line. And if you start calculating the losses of these investors and this money, you're talking some big numbers here, and this will shake the municipalities and shake the city of Portland and shake the, st the state of Oregon. And why that is is that all these social services that you rely upon are the property tax base, and it's being ripped apart and gutted out in this city. I look at the politicians and say, hey, you wanted to use the developers and the investors as your scapegoats for things that don't get done and look at them and blame them for everything. At a certain point, people begin to believe that. You have dropped the commercial real estate industry by your comments by the way that you speak about them and what they're trying to do in the cities. What you see out there right now is the result of what you have done. What you have done, the politicians. Again, we have Jordan Snitzer out there saying, I'm gonna revitalize Portland by art. Let me say this to you, my good friend, Jordan Snitzer. I refer to you as the thinking man, but we are in the gates of hell. The gates of hell. And we are going to have to make some moves to save this city. I'm asking for a moratorium on all property taxes for three years to save this city. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for public testimony. So I will move on to R1. R1 budget modification number J. OHS-001-24, increasing the Joint Office Supportive Housing Fund by $17.69 million for the Corrective Action Plan. So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R1. So in a few minutes, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dan Field to present uh, 
on the budget modification and as well as the uh, joint office leadership team. Um, they're gonna be able to provide us and walk us through um, final details for the investments and then we will have time for the board to discuss this. But I wanted to start off by just um, thanking everyone for the engagement into this process, the way that we have had the work sessions, the way that we have um, been able to um, really do this in a more transparent, open way is different than how the board has done things in the past. And I just appreciate the engagement people have, the respectful way that they have um, participated in these conversations. I think they've been productive. I think they've been in service to the communities who need um, and deserve these investments that we are gonna be making. I also appreciate um, the fact that we are gonna continue to have this type of conversation as we as we move forward and work on um, other um, joint office uh, supportive housing service measure dollars that we're gonna consider in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, it is a process, anytime you do something new, um, you learn where the bumps are, you learn where you can um, make things better, where you can refine things, and, um, and I think this has been true of that. I think um, we are all learning in this, but I'm glad that we continue to take the time to listen, to engage, to discuss, to question, to think through the different proposals we have as a board, the different proposals we have as colleagues, I think that's incredibly helpful. And I look forward to the, to the rest of the upcoming discussions as we help set our priorities for moving forward together on, on a this, the, I would say, one of the most critical issues in our community, which is, it, which is um, the crisis of homelessness. Um, I also wanna say um, that our discussions over the last few weeks and our vote today is really the legislative action that we take to move these priorities forward with urgency, with accountability, with transparency, so that we can continue to improve our response to this crisis. The, the work that comes after this, which is really the implementation of the corrective app um, action plan. That's the administrative work that's going to be led by the joint office. But what I commit to doing is making sure that this board um, has the information that we um, have to share with Metro in terms of how things are going with the work, how things are going with these investments, how the spending is looking like, making sure that this board is aware of that, you know, b before that is shared with the Metro or more publicly. Um, I am. Um, you know, looking forward to this conversation, I also wanna um, make sure we have plenty of time for um, questions and discussion. So I now invite um, Dan and Kunoy and Antoinette to the dais to join us to um, go through the final details and answer um, questions that we have. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Uh, my name is Dan Field, Director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Joined this morning by Kanoi Eggleston, our programs leader, and Antoinette Payne, our finance leader, and they'll carry the bulk of the presentation. I'd like to echo uh, just a couple things that the chair said in introducing our, uh, our slide presentation. One, um, we appreciate the direction as well. Uh, the joint office staff and leadership team serves at, at your direction, and you've provided a lot of that over the past few weeks with regard to the corrective action plan. And that's been a helpful process for us as well. So as you vote today and set the direction for us, know that we will continue to seek your input and guidance as we implement the strategies and the uh, funding uh, requests that you've set. I also wanna mention that in the course of the conversations over the last few weeks and listening to the work session, we've heard you loud and clear about wanting to see metrics and very specific desired outcomes in each of the projects. And we hope that comes through loud and clear here this morning. And if you have additional uh, suggestions around metrics and outcomes, uh, we absolutely are open to that input as we begin the implementation process. So with that, what we're gonna do is ask um, my colleagues to run through the four major um, spending proposals that uh, the chair has put in front of you this morning. Um, and I'll kick it off to Kanoi to start us. Good morning. Good, good morning, next slide, please. This actually might be Antoinette's. <laughs> good morning, <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, my name is Antoinette Payne. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the finance manager for the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. As mentioned in the previous presentation, I won't spend as much time this slide outlines the cap that we have with Metro around the unspent SHS funding from FY23. In column two, the cap items initially negotiated with Metro due to the increase in expenditures than estimated, the revised cap has decreased. The last column has 43.7 million program and 14.4 million in contingencies and reserves, totaling 48 
58.1 million. Of that 58.1 million, 40.5 million is in the adopted budget, which is reflected in column three. And the focus of today's presentation is the 17.6 million in column 14. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Oh, we got it, okay, good. This slide is the summary of the budget modification, modification appropriating 17.6 million from the SHS underspend for the Metro cap. Here is an overview of the cap investments that encompasses the 17.6 million. 4.7 million for the capital investment, the TAS, 10 million for the capacity uh, building grants, 1.4 million for immediate response client and rent assistance, and 1.5 million for expanded employment programs. Now I will hand it off to Kanoi, our director of programs, to provide some programmatic details on the four cap investments. Next slide, please. Thank you, Antoinette. Good morning, all. My name is Kanoi Eagleston. My pronouns are she and hers. I'm the director of programs here at the joint office. I'll briefly review each of the proposed cap investments for board action today. The first proposed investment is focused on the expansion of shelter bed capacity through the development of two additional temporary alternative shelter sites that will be developed and operated in partnership with the city of Portland. This provides a capital investment towards the purchase of 140 sleeping pods and the outbuildings required to provide hygiene and support services on site at both locations. As proposed, one site will provide 140 sleeping pods and the second site will be an RV safe parking site. The sites will be open this fiscal year and increase shelter expansion across our homeless services system by 200 additional shelter bed options. Next slide, please. Oh, and here are the key metrics and my, uh, proposed outcomes that I just spoke about. Next slide, please. The second proposed investment is focused to increase the organizational health capacity and resilience of our currently funded joint office providers to recruit employees, retain their workforce, and deliver on the services they are contracted to provide. Some core components of this investment include grant distribution where the administration and reporting will be managed through a philanthropic organization or directly by the county. Grant amounts will vary and awards will be allocated on an equitable formula derived from providers' contracted budgets. And eligible expenses for capacity building grants must meet SHS funding criteria, must explain how funds will increase employee recruitment and retention, and must report on how funds were spent. Oh, I'm gonna move us on to the next slide so you all can read along with me, thank you. <laughs> We will focus our metrics on employee vacancy and retention rates. So our provider organizations will report their baseline of um, vacancy and retentions and will receive, obtain outcomes on the percentages of decrease in vacancy rates, hopefully an increase of retention rates. So the flexibility offered by these grants give our partners uh, the opportunity to determine the most effective way for them to become stronger and more resilient organizations. We want to know that our homeless services providers have the tools in place in their organizations to be able to expand and retain the workforce needed to really deliver those high quality and much needed services in our community. The healthier an organization is, the more immediate and effective the implementation of our investments truly can be. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our third proposed investment that will make readily available client and rent assistance to joint office providers with the goal to reduce barriers in housing, retain households facing eviction and homelessness, and increase those housing placements. So those core components do include the increase in housing placements, ensure that immediate distribution um, of you know, short and long, short, excuse me, and medium term rental assistance, deposits and move-in assistance, and then approving, um, improving our access to these funds uh, to be able to readily support um, households reducing those housing barriers and get application ready. Um, some key metrics include uh, over 221 people enrolled into okay. permanent housing. Next oh, slide. 
Shucks, thank you so much, Chair. I'm just, I'm so excited to talk about the metrics, evidently, that I keep going <laughs> before the slides. So excuse me, um, I wanna make note of our key metrics. So combined with our 6.6 .6 million uh, in a, our adopted budget, this investment will be 8 million in total and it will serve um, 221 people enrolled into permanent housing programs through prevention or placement with a proposed outcome of 80% individuals retained in permanent housing. Next slide, please. And our final proposed investment focuses on the expansion of employment opportunities for people with lived experience of homelessness, providing them with a path to future work while also supporting the reduction of trash and waste in our public spaces. Some core components of this investment include four mobile teams across the county. These teams conduct routine cleaning routes to pick up and dispose of trash throughout the neighborhoods and business districts. On these cleaning routes, um, the mobile teams safely remove all garbage, debris, and abandoned materials from the area. The team is made up of one lead and three crew members, so four total um, within a team, and we'll have four teams total. Mm -hmm. The lead really focuses on that, you know, supporting the cleaning route, supporting and mentoring uh, the trainees as they learn job training skills, and the trainees are part of this work readiness program, and participants will learn job readiness skills and obtain that employment history. Next slide, please. And the key metrics uh, will include at least 25 individuals with lived experience of homelessness engaging in employment services and supports with proposed outcomes to include 60% of those individuals leaving um, the training program with employment placement and at least 250,000 pounds of waste removed. I wanna thank you all this morning for giving me some space to be able to talk about those four proposed investments and I'll turn it back over to Dan. Just a final comment on Clean Start. Um, it's interesting, as part of the discussions with the county uh, commissioners, it was really clear that we didn't just want an expansion of the existing uh, downtown Portland focus program. And so um, if you have a chance to dig into the details around that last investment, it really is a county focused program. It's different than what you see downtown. It's mobile teams. They're assigned specifically to all regions of the county. So that's an example, I think, of where your feedback and the partnership of, of a lead organization has been very helpful in designing a program that's gonna serve the entire county. Um, so with that, turn it over for questions. Great, thank you so much for this information um, today and for all the work in putting together this package. I know that there's been a lot of conversations, a lot of questions that have been answered and really appreciate the work of the joint office in doing that. Um, we'll go to the board for, um, for questions, for comments. Um, Commissioner Myron, you're virtual, so um, we can start with you, and we'll bring you up on screen so everybody can see your face. There we go. Um, let's see. I, can you, can. I, I actually, I'm, can you hear me? I'm having some technical difficulties, so if you, you're able to circle back to me, that would be really great. Of course, yeah, definitely. We will go to Thank Commissioner you. Jerry Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for this presentation. I really appreciate it and all the work that has gone into to bringing us to this point. Um, I want to appreciate the Chair and her team for answering all of our questions um, for the work sessions that we've had. That's been a different practice for us, and I do think it's been productive. And Dan, thank you for giving us an example of how the conversations that we had actually influenced what you're bringing forward. Um, you know, I'll start by saying that I will support the package. Um, and I'm gonna reiterate some of the comments I've made before because I, I think they're important and I think they're important to make as we make the decision. So I'm keeping in mind and reiterating that one of the main reasons we have underspent funds and that's what we're here to decide how to allocate. One of the main reasons that we have those underspent funds is that our nonprofit providers have not been able to hire and retain the staff they need to provide the services that we need them to provide. So the community capacity building grants for me are a clear priority. We've heard this not only from providers themselves, including this morning, but from advocates like Here Together, the Portland Business Alliance, or I'm sorry, Portland Metro Chamber, and the Welcome Home Coalition. Providing this kind of support was also a clear priority expressed by the SHS Oversight Committee, which is made up of people from the business, healthcare, housing services, and nonprofit sectors. 
the issue was actually referenced even one of the emails I received just yesterday around Vibe Lakes, which um, I think we'll be discussing later, but the email was from an individual who's worked with work to place homeless folks in their neighborhood into shelters and found that shelters didn't have capacity. They had the beds, but they didn't have the staff to, to service the beds. So all of this advocacy confirms what nonprofit providers have been telling us for a very long time, that their workers are significantly underpaid. We also now have two studies that confirm this, one for providers in the Sun system and one for joint office providers. For members of the public who haven't had a chance to review the wage study, I want to read out the median salary for the three positions in shelter systems with the largest numbers of workers. Shelter support staff, $39,250 a year. Case manager one, $42,848 per year. Shelter navigator coordinator, $43,680 per year. Now compare that to the cost of rent in the Portland metro area. According to rent.com, the median rent for a one bedroom in Portland is $1,499 a month. That's an annual rent of $17,988. So I'm gonna do the percentages of their annual income that each of those categories of workers pays for rent. Starting with the highest paid, the services navigator coordinator, $43,680,000 a year. That means that rent takes up 41% of their annual income. For a case manager one at $42,848 a year, their rent takes up 42% of their income. And for shelter support staff, a vital position, their rent takes up 46% of their income per year. And let's all in this room think about where we would be if those were the incomes and the percentages of our income going to rent that we have to manage. It's not sustainable. So I've called this wage issue out almost every year I've been on this dais during the budget process. It's a fundamental problem for the county and it's a fundamental problem for our community at large. It's a problem because underpaid workers who are themselves housing unstable add to our homelessness crisis it's a problem because it leads to not having the workforce that we need. And it's a problem because none of us would want to live in a community where people are not paid to do the work that they do. Last year, I fought for and was able to get an extra 1% on top of the COLA, which only addresses inflation. It doesn't deal with the underlying wage gap for all of our nonprofit contracts. But these are all short-term solutions. We need comprehensive, long-term solutions to address wages and other issues around maintaining a strong, resilient nonprofit sector. We need other funders like the city and the state and philanthropy to participate in developing the solutions. We've kicked the can down the road for decades. I'm excited about the possibility of enlisting a philanthropic partner to help design and administer these capacity building grants and also to be a catalyst for engagement by the rest of the philanthropic sector. There's also other wake work underway to address these issues. The Oregon Solutions Project is doing a convening. There's a nonprofit modernization act that passed the legislature. But in the meantime, we have organizations that cannot do the work we need them to do because they don't have the staff because we don't fund them to adequately pay their staff. Commissioner Brim Edwards raised a question on Tuesday about why organizations agree to contracts that don't fund them adequately. It's a great question and one that I've asked every executive director I've spoken to. Part of the answer is situational to this particular moment in time in an incredibly tight market, which they didn't necessarily foresee when the contract was signed. But the larger part of the answer I've been given is that they are mission driven and want to do the work. So a contractor that has run shelters for us for a decade whose wages haven't kept up because they were already low and have fallen farther behind is really loath to walk away from the contract and close shelter beds. It's the same reason many workers sign on to do these low paying jobs. We could ask the same question about why people agree to do jobs at these wages. Because they're mission driven and sometimes because there aren't other jobs available. The fact that providers or workers agree to something that they shouldn't have agreed to doesn't mean that it's right or sustainable or that we think they shouldn't have agreed to. So I do believe that I've told CEO Cruz and Director Field that we need to review every single one of the joint office contracts to do two things. Make sure that what we're paying reflects the true cost of services 
and make sure that we and our partners are clear about expected outcomes. Along for, with pressing for wage increases, I have also repeatedly pressed for more accountability in the form of meaningful contract metrics and outcomes. But accountability is a two-way street. We can't hold organizations accountable if we don't pay them enough to pay their employees. So I think these capacity building grants are really important. They don't solve the problem by a long shot, but as long as we have these one-time funds, they're a good and necessary use of those funds. And I completely agree that there should be metrics attached to the grants. The clearest ones are the ones that Kanoi identified for us, and I think that we, with our partners, can, up, can come up with ours, others as well. The goals will be different for each provider, but they should each be required to, telling us what they're, to tell us what they're going to accomplish with the funding, and we should evaluate whether they've achieved those goals at the completion of the grant period. So those are my comments on the capacity building grants. Um, I made some comments about the employment opportunities and Doug Fur on Tuesday. I won't repeat them now. I didn't say anything on Tuesday about the TAS investment, so we'll make a few comments about that. I was not supportive of the city's original plan to have 500-person mass camping sites because I didn't believe those could be managed well. I'm still concerned that even 140 people in a managed campsite is a lot to manage well. I also think these sites are very expensive related to other options. But we do have to try different models, so I'm supportive of this limited capital investment in these two sites. I'll mention that I did not see expected outcomes with respect to those sites, so I would like uh, follow up on that. And you know, I think with respect to these sites and all of our shelter sites, we do need to develop outcomes that reflect not only the number of people sheltered, because that can't be our objective, just to shelter more and more people, but also the rate of housing placement and retention. So with that, I will wrap up, and I'll be voting yes on this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jair Paul. Um, oh, okay, so we have a question. So there was a question about when we are gonna do public comment. We normally have, um, we are definitely gonna have public comment on this. I wanted to give the board a chance to ask any questions. If people wanna ask questions, um, we can have board comments. I mean, I'm sorry, we can have, um, public testimony and then people can make final comments. I realize, Commissioner Jayapal, you made very good um, comments. Yes, so I um, so appreciate that. But if that's, but we will, I mean, we'll, I know that we have many people signed up here to testify. We normally do board questions first and then we go to public comment. So if you have questions that you would like to ask, we can do that and then we can um, go through the board for any questions folks have and then bring up public comment. Can we go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. And I shared that note with it. it was more of a just a general question yeah. versus yes. like wanting to change the process um so i think i'm going to do um my comments in a little bit different i'm going to have have some questions some comments and then i'll um about the presentation and then i'll have some final comments after the public testimony yeah that's fine um great uh so let's see my questions and comments first of all i have two comments that i want to um just thank the chair for um as a follow-up to the questions that we had at the last uh, meeting about the um about the board and the, and the commission getting the um, information on our monthly reports and our quarterly reports that are provided to metro that we get those um first is it just a good governance practice and i appreciate uh the commitment to do that so thank you and i also um want to um, thank you for adding into both the presentation but also well the written presentation but also the presentation here this morning um, some metrics that we all can look at um, I think it's going to be super important to our community because um, they, they have their own set of metrics and um, we need to be demonstrating value and that we're the approaches and the investments we're making um, have um, are moving us towards towards our goals. So I, I really want to thank you for adding those those in. I think they're a very important um, addition. Um, so I had a couple just questions and just want to confirm um, that, I mean, the, the first one is just an overarching campaign uh, a question. The, I think an earlier presentation we had at the last slide had this is the totality of the 60 million here's the impact of the totality of the 60 million dollar investment um so this morning we're just focusing on the 17 million but um because 40 40 million of it was already approved in last year's budget cycle but the totality of if we make all these investments and they have the effect that we're 
um, hope they have the impact on, say, number of people moved off the streets or that are housed or um, what, I'm noticing this last um, presentation doesn't have that slide anymore, and I'm wondering if you could speak, speak to that. At the end of the day, the $60 million in investment results in X number of more people off the streets or more people housed, and that would probably be the rent assistance, the shelter. I want to say the numbers were like 350 and 800. So, okay, I could take that one. So yes, you're correct that the outcomes associated today were specific to the 17.6. And what I hear you asking for is that totality of the, including the 40 million. And to be able to give you that, we'll have to circle back um, with you to be able to provide number of people served um, off the streets and then how many people placed. Because I want to make sure that we isolate all the 40 million. So I apologize that that wasn't included in this uh, presentation today. That, that's okay. Um, I just think that'll be an important metric if we go back of like, we, we spend a, yep. you know, ver made a very significant set of investments. Granted, some of it was in last year's budget, but the collective, um, what are what is the underspend going to actually accomplish? In that I, front? I appreciate you asking us to keep our eye on that larger ball, if you will. One of the challenges has been the funding occurs in increments: the 23 budget, the cap, the 20, the SHS. We're not even done yet, so reminding us to roll back up to those high-level metrics is helpful. It's just it's a lot of money that's going out the door, and yep. so we can look at those. Like, we'll be able to look at the individual pieces, but then also the larger piece. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and then a question on slide seven, um, which is the um, it's the providers, uh, the ten the ten million dollars for providers. The currently the the metric is a percentage and. I'm wondering, you said you'd be open to a um, sort of uh, recommendation um, that we have a percentage, but also just a, like a, a number. So for example, um, if somebody has 20 vacancies and they you know, fill 10 of them, they've made 50% progress, which is very different from two vacancies and we've filled one. Just, so just to be able to give us a, a, a more concrete sense of what that is, and I assume we're going to have the data. We're going to have the data anyway, so yeah, if we could just add that. Um, I think it'll be, it'll pro provide us with more um, deeper information. And then um, on slides eight and nine on the rent assistance, this is um, a, a question and maybe a request for sort of whenever we talk about rent assistance, that um, in terms of transparency for the community, to be really clear where we actually are m moving individuals um, from the streets to um, using rent assistance into housing versus those that um, we're catching before they fall into homelessness. because. I think this is a point that we're going to continue to have to um, differentiate, even though it, it has the same results, because uh, I don't think the broader community um, views it the same way and or, or understands it, because we can say we use rent assistance to um, you know, keep a thousand people um, housed, and yet, um, if there's still the thousand people on the street that haven't been, there's there's a question of like, well, I don't understand that they said that a thousand people had received um, housing through rent assistance, and yet there's still this piece. So just continuing to like differentiate, to make that differentiation, so we we can understand like what exactly we're doing, because they're they're two different things. They have both have mm -hmm. positive mm -hmm. goals, but they're two different things. Um, so that would be just um, a sort of going forward question. And then um, my last just comment, um, I appreciate both the um, presentation but also the briefing about the focus on all the different quadrants in the city by the Clean Start teams. Um, I think, pardon? I'm sorry, the county. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> the, the four quadrants of the county. Um, as I, I know that we all, are hearing from our 
business districts in the surrounding neighborhoods and other places in our community gathering spots that um, we could all benefit from that and also the employment opportunities. Um, so those are just my questions and comments. Um, I do want to share that um, I had um, shared with my uh, fellow uh, commissioners that I was going to offer a um, an amendment this morning on day shelters, um, which with a, a day shelter fund, which is something I put in my original pro proposal, um, that would have been about three million dollars to support the city, the city's new day camping, daytime camping restrictions, and I had planned to offer that amendment uh, for several reasons. Um, one, unlike everybody else, I didn't participate in last year's budget process, so I'm a little bit of you know catching up, um, and then second. Um, because of the nature of how the cap was, the corrective action plan was formed, um, and frankly, we were informed by the media that the corrective action plan had been signed, and also that as an individual commissioner, I wasn't um, consulted about the individual components. So um, when we had the package coming forward this morning, um, again, I feel a real sense of urgency and I feel that sense of urgency from the community also about doing something. Um, and we had received an, um, an email that we could offer amendments this morning, uh, whether it was on the cap or with other SHS funds. Having said that, I wanna say that I had a really good conversation this morning with um, the chair. And um, I think I, I feel, um, comfortable that we have a shared concern and um, commitment to providing daytime supports uh, for individuals who are going to be um, impacted by the um, upcoming implementation um, and um, of the, the city's time, place, and manner camping restrictions, um, but not just the individuals um, who will be impacted by it. The, with no daytime camping, but also the, the surrounding communities. Um, and in, in addition, as part of that conversation, um, we talked about the fact that next week, the um, impact study um, that the county has done on time, place, and manner and the camping restrictions will be available to us. And originally, I had structured my suggestion for, this, for the amendment to create this fund was um, had sort of two components. One was the establishment of the fund. The second was um, when we got the results of the impact study, creating, we had a placeholder for funding for, for that as well. And they're really designed to be complementary. Um, again, to not just um, provide supports to the individuals who um, will be impacted by the camping restrictions, but also to the, the neighborhoods and the communities um, that surround um, places where individuals are, are camping. And because they're, they're interconnected, I'm going to defer to next week um, and the, that discussion because we'll have both sides, of those, both pieces of those information and the complementary uh, pieces. So um, I will be waiting for that. And I have, um, so th that will come uh, next week and I appreciate the conversation th this morning and I think our shared commitment to provide supports, but also in partner work in partnership with the, with the city. Um, so I'll save the rest of my comments for after public comment and the final action. Yes, thank you so much, um, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, have you um, figured out your, your technical difficulties? Oh, you I think, I think so. Okay, we can hear um, you just, just fine. We can hear and see you just fine. Okay, great. Um, so, so is this? Are we doing questions now or board comments? So we're, we'll we'll do questions now, where then we'll take public testimony. If anyone has any final comments, they can make them um, after the public comment. Okay. Um, well, I I don't uh, have any any specific any specific questions. Um, I. Do you have a proposed um, a proposed amendment? I'm not sure if that would go here or if that should go after we finish talking about a bud mod amendment. Um, 
or amendment to the cap. I'm not sure about the, pr the process or procedure. Sure, so hold on, Commissioner. I will ask our legal experts in the room. So does it matter when it's considered? Well, I thought we needed to wait until actually the amendment was proposed before we, or the, uh, the, the proposed, final. does the amendment, does it matter when the amendment is proposed before or after public comment? No, not before or after public okay. comment. Yeah. Okay, all right. So it, it's really up to you, Commissioner Myron, of when you want to bring the amendment forward. Okay, well, um, will that mean that we have to stop and, and vote on it now? I would want, I will, I would like to propose um, an amendment. Okay. Let's just say that. Okay. And uh, it is, um, it is slightly different from what I shared with uh, board members, uh, just because of uh, initially it was going to request um, or add funds from the unanticipated FY23 uh, as a uh, F FY 2023 funds, but um, I understand that that could. Uh, cause some challenges in notice or something. So I'm going to propose um, bringing them, adding the money from a different source. So essentially uh, it is around the capacity building uh, portion of the, um, of the cap. And, you know, I, I filled in some introduction to this uh, in what I've I've shared with the board, but I know it got to you uh, later. Um, it got to you this morning, uh, but I've talked to all of you about it. And so, Commissioner, essentially, so, huh? so I so I will um, definitely give you a chance to talk through it. I want we have a, a motion to consider amendment. Do we have a second? For the to consider the amendment second okay commissioner myron moves to consider an amendment commissioner brim edwards seconds um consideration of the amendment as proposed by commissioner myron okay go ahead oh wait, thank you do we have to vote on it no we did no we just okay yeah just go ahead and yeah now you can provide the explanation okay <laughs> sorry about this and uh i'm sorry i can't be there in person today uh it but Basically, um, you know, since shifting to a bifurcated system where Multnomah County contracts with community-based organizations to provide the vast majority of our health, human, and homeless services, these organizations have struggled, as uh, Commissioner Jayapal alluded to, as we talk frequently about, they've struggled to do more with less. In particular, frontline employees have been paid less and less while taking on some of the hardest jobs in the county that have become even more difficult, stressful, and even physically dangerous than ever before. All of this, you know, we've known for years is highlighted in the Joint Office of Workforce Wage Study. We know the system as a whole needs to be overhauled and difficult decisions made around support for the workers and amount and quality of services being provided. The term capacity building has, has been a difficult one for me. It's been increasingly used in county budgets to describe somewhat vague investments in community-based organizations, but without a clear indication of being of goals being sought or outcomes to be achieved, or what that means in terms of the individuals who we are charged with actually serving, who are recipients of the services. And so it's been used as a catch-all sometimes. Um, the recent joint office audit called out the county's approach to contracting with CBOs and um, talked about that need because there is some lack of performance evaluation, um, accountability, outcomes, analytics, uh, that those are serious gaps in how we um, engage with community-based organizations and uh, managing the contracts with them, et cetera. And so I have said for a long time, we need to do an overhaul of our contracting system with CBOs, but 
we can, and that's that's going to be a, a challenge that I hope we can meet. But I feel we shouldn't be investing without doing what we can now to address some of those stark realities um, and um, and address that for what has been allocated for capacity building um, in this cap. And so this amendment seeks to recognize the intent of supporting CBOs in doing their difficult work while helping to inform their operations and achieve their optimal outcomes for the future with the ultimate goal of demonstrating a measurable positive impact on reducing chronic homelessness and getting services to the real people living in our community. I propose that we amend the cap by adding $1 million or by using $1 million of the 10 million for purposes of completing independent evaluations that will guide uh, future capacity building investments through the joint office. It will um, be used for constructive independent evaluation by a third party of the practices, policies, and procedures um, for at least a selection, say 10, um, five largest and five smallest community-based organizations receiving SHS funds from the county. The purpose will be to specifically identify improvements that can optimize the organization's abilities to meet contract requirements and achieve the results outlined in their contracts with the county. Information obtained can be put to use by the organization in the short term and also provide information that can optimize the work of CBOs in the longer term inform future county investments so we're investing wisely and uh, so that uh, we are meeting, we are addressing some of the gaps right now that have been called out in the, uh, in the audit. So that's the so amendment is to. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Can you, can you provide a, um, uh, just just state succinctly just for for the board clerk and for our, the records the um, the the what is being proposed and yeah what the, what the funding source is just just you know just a couple of imposing questions. one million dollars uh, from the capacity building um, the ten million dollars of capacity building currently in the cap to devote to uh, the, the services, the um, independent evaluation services. Can I okay. have a question for the proposer? Uh, yeah, we'll have, we'll have questions from the board. And it's actually about like the form of her amendment because um, it looks like different. So she, she started off by saying what she, the, the paper that we have in front of us is different than what she's actually proposing. So just to clarify, and correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Martin, you are proposing to take $1 million from the $10 million that is currently being proposed in the cap to de dedicate to capacity building for organizations and using that $1 million um, for the um, independent evaluation of, um, of some of the organizations. Correct, correct. The, the $1 million divided by 39 organizations would have minimal impact, but a real um, evaluation, best practices type audit can have tremendous impact and return on investment. Okay. Thank you so much for um, bringing that um, amendment you. forward. We have a motion and a second, so we'll now move to discussion on the amendment, and we will start with Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Myron. I guess I, I just want to understand better the specific issues that you want to address with this assessment. So the issues that we are clear on, I think, are wages um, and contracting practices. Those have been called out by the audit, um, by providers themselves, and are being addressed you know, I, I think this, as I, the, the cap amendment is the capacity building is intended to at least go some distance towards employee hiring and retention. 
um, we've got management health associates that's doing an evaluation of contracting practices, but I, I might then turn this question to the joint office to make sure that that's true. So I, I, I just want to be clearer on the, the problem that, that you are trying to solve with this assessment. Is it about those issues or is it about concerns that you have around other policies, practices, performance of, of our NGO partners? It includes those issues, but it is it is broader and it's seeking to, you know, the thing is we will get we will get a report on the HMA um, findings. We, you know, I've uh, in talking to some some folks, they say, OK, yes, this is going to be a big thing for next year's budget. And then that will take time to implement. I feel that we lose time each time we put off each time we have a bucket of funds in front of us and we put off using it for the things we need we know need to be done to increase uh, accountability and um and transparency and all the these things we talk about and so knowing that needs to happen i am proposing one million dollars be used so that we can get started and an ex example would be an organization saying we need you know we need data a data analyst because we don't we don't have the capacity to do what's needed to get the data together even to give to you as the county which i i hear frequently and which is so i i know is a deep need what this could do is if a third party organization goes in to help the CBO works through, hears from them what they need, looks at their systems, they can say, oh yeah, you do need a data analytics sort of system. That would include you know, the software uh, for the system. That would include 1.5 FTE to help do it. That would, you know, it would inform what's needed to make our investment effective rather than what I see this as a, as a one-time only, Okay, let's. The CBOs know what they need, but how to most effectively deploy that? I think we can be helpful there. So I thank you. I appreciate that. So I have a follow-up question for the Joint Office. Um, we have other funding for general capacity building, I believe, in the Joint Office budget. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question is, are providers able to use that other capacity building funding to conduct the kind of assessment that Commissioner Myron is describing? So if they felt, you know, we're not quite sure what we need, we think maybe we need a data analyst, but we're not sure, is, is there funding available in other buckets for them to do that? There is other funding available. It's also my understanding they could use their allocation of this funding of the 10 million to in part do their own evaluation at the direction of their board or their staff uh, that would help frame the way they spent uh, the balance of their allocation so my my the thing is is that i don't want to a put that burden onto the organizations themselves or say okay, you're gonna have to spend your small allotment of funding on doing this extra work and figuring it out. I believe it's our responsibility as a board, as the county overseeing these organizations, when we've been informed that the contracting practices are um, dysfunctional and uh, you know we've seen huge additional investments in organizations with some maybe not the results, definitely not the results that seem like they correlate to the additional level of investment. It's, I believe it's our responsibility as the county to engage in a coordinated process so that we can ensure accountability and coordination of efforts and uh, coherence across all of the organizations, not not just one-offs. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Burm Edwards, any questions? Yeah, um, this is m more of a question about the actual amendment because um, I'm, 
interested to know, Commissioner Myron, whether you are um, would be open to a friendly amendment, and I would look to counsel on how to offer this because um, I would be supportive of this, but um, I was supportive of the the proposal that came forward. And my understanding from discussions yesterday is, and and also the invitation from um, the chair's chief of staff that we could offer amendments. Um, for the SHS funds or other funds that um, that be allowed, and my friend, me the friendly amendment, Commissioner Myron, that I would like to offer is, and again, I'll uh, defer on like what the, what the what the correct parliamentary procedure is, but that it reverts to the actual to what actually was um, presented um, in the the written document, which is the additional one million um, instead of coming out of the uh, 10 million for providers, so we keep that intact, um, but that it um, come from the FY23 unanticipated SHS revenue. So procedurally, I put you already know, I think we need to do one amendment at a time, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I think that there's two questions okay. here. One, procedurally, if there's any changes to the amendment, we have to, and, and we talked about this last week too, if there's any changes to an amendment, we have to consider this amendment as it was originally proposed in its entirety do the vote on that, and then if you, if we were to consider a change to the amendment, that would be a separate amendment process itself. So we, so we have to go through. Am I, oh, sorry, Chair. So we, am I allowed to suggest that my own amendment? So the a moment has it's been moved and seconded was around using. $1 million from the um, okay. currently proposed $10 million for the capacity building grants. For, so that is what's under discussion for the board. Um, and that is, we have to consider okay. that in its entirety as it was as it was moved and seconded. Um, you know, and then again, we, you can always have a second amendment um, subsequently around changes. I think when that would be brought forward, if, if that were to be brought forward, I think there is a another question around what was publicly noticed um, was the fact that we would be considering considering um, the cap amendment and the um, underspending of the supportive housing service measure dollars, and that is a different funding source which hasn't been noticed. So how how we would have to do that type of consideration? I, I think we would need to have better explanation around what that would look like. You want so you to just oh. can I speak to just a moment because actually the commissioner hadn't even got her. Um, whole amendment out. Um, so when there was asked request for a second, um, she actually hadn't presented it yet. So I was basing it on this. So that, that's why I was trying to like get a clarification because after I seconded it, then it was like a different amendment. <laughs> I was trying, I, can I offer a clarification here? My intention was to offer the amendment that you have all received that is in, is what Commissioner Brim Edwards intended to second. And literally right before my doing this, I got a email from Jenny Madcore suggesting that that for some notice reasons that it wouldn't be possible. I I do not understand what the challenge is, but the only reason that I actually changed the amendment was because I was told with a notice issue, I could not make the amendment around unanticipated revenue. So I would intend for the unanticipated revenue, you know, I will, it, that that can be used to do additional capacity building to fill the gap. I didn't, I do not intend to take funds in the big picture away from community-based organizations. My intent was not to do that. It was procedurally um, very murky. And initially I had thought we could bring forward amendments that would allow us to take the unanticipated uh, in, um, to consider the unanticipated funds as part of this. That's where my confusion stemmed from. And uh, and so. So why don't we go to our lawyer to provide some <laughs> guidance on the, um, the 
issues surrounding the which funding is being used for the, the proposed amendments. So I've got the APR up, and that's what I'm relying on, although I don't necessarily know what funding sources everyone's relying on. So what we've noticed the public is what's listed in uh, number seven on the APR, which says uh, what revenue is being changed and why, and it talks about unspent SHS revenue from fiscal year 2023. So it specifies that funding source. So I don't know exactly, since I'm not familiar, if Commissioner Myron is proposing using a different funding source, and if so, that's where the notice issue would come in. So if we've noticed the public that we're talking about a specific funding source and then we're changing that, that would be, for the amendment, that would be the notice problem. There's still other ways we can go about it, but that would be, on this issue, would be the issue I've seen. So I don't know the funding. Can I, just a point of clarification, it's, it's all, as, I mean, I had two long discussions about this yesterday, about a different amendment. Um, but up about the same concept of, um, and also be trying to be respectful of the chair putting together, put, putting forward a cap proposal, and also the guidance we received from um, the chair's staff, is that um, it was SHS funding, um, and it's all going to the joint office, um, and whether it's underspend or under anticipated, it's it's funding that's SHS funding that's going through the joint joint office. So. I appreciate that. I, it, it is same funding, but I think because of the way it was noticed, talking about unspent revenue, that is the you know that is the funding source. So I would say, um, what is the what would the process look like if people wanted to consider a different funding source than what was noticed? One option would be a unanimous consent item. So that I think you're familiar with that, where where this could be proposed today, and then a unanimous consent item. I think you know the process for that, because that could come on the calendar without notice. Another option would be to bring it up next week at the next week's meeting. So I think those are two options that are on the table. Okay. Yeah. Let me. So let me. I will just let me make it easier. I um, apologize for uh, any. Um, you know, for, for the time that this is taken, although I think these are really important issues uh, that bear discussion because it bears on accountability, um, I will bring this forward in a different form next week. Um, we'll clarify and uh, just avoid the, the confusion here, move along and um, withdraw my proposed amendment. Is that allowable? <laughs> There are some very confusing, um, there's a lot of confusion here about uh, what we were allowed and were not allowed to do, so. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. So um, I will check with our attorney in terms of, can a person who has brought forward an amendment um, withdraw it before there's a vote? I, oh, thank you, I'm sorry. I believe so. Yes, you can withdraw it. Okay, so we will allow it if, as long as the person who seconds um, agrees to the withdrawal of the amendment. Yeah, I just uh, actually w w before I w agree to the withdrawal, um, just state that um, I'm I'm supportive of the concept. Um, I I wouldn't support taking a um, million dollars out of the providers, and I'm sorry you got put in that position because I I, I think it's a very important work that needs to happen. Um, I also. Um, think that when we have agenda items that are coming that um, we need to be clear with everybody about what exactly the rules are because if we're told we can offer amendments um, then um, that's something that we rely on and um, I think it will um, from a governance standpoint um, make us more effective and also have everybody have the same set of rules and understandings of what can be offered so with that yes I agree as a seconder Okay, that's wonderful. So we will consider the amendment withdrawal. We will move on to continue discussion on the underlying um, supplemental budget um, motion R1. I will say for everyone on the board who may be considering coming to amendment, I would just check in with our legal department as you're considering making proposed amendments. Um, we, we don't traditionally do a lot of amendment making um, you know, individually as a board, but there seems to be appetite for that, which is fine. I will say, you know, just hearkening back to my experience as a, as a state representative, anytime we had an amendment for, um, that we were proposing on a bill, right, it was not just like consulted, but legislative council actually wrote the amendment to make sure that it was proper and aligned with that. So I would just say that as a, as a point of order, I'm also looking for 
I think it would be really helpful for our attorneys to provide guidance to the board on like the process and procedure for bringing forward amendments so that we can all be on the same page and make sure that people do feel like they have the right information that they need um, to make sure that this process goes smoother. Um, I appreciate the, um, you know, uh, I, and I want to encourage like um, Commissioner Myron for bringing forward things like this, but again, I want to make sure everybody has the tools and information so that people can feel, you know, that they have the right information and we're able to bring these things forward properly. Um, yeah, so, so with that, we're going to return to um, conversation around the underlying proposal and um, Commissioner Myron, I, I believe you said you didn't have any questions on this. You were bringing forward. I don't have questions. I will have comments, but I'd like to make those after the public comment question that's, period that's great okay so we'll move on for any um, questions by commissioner stegman thank you uh, i would just like to address the board and uh, and i appreciate the chair's office giving us the opportunity to have these work sessions and have full transparency and i think that that's been really beneficial i would also ask for that same courtesy from my fellow board members when amendments are dropped literally at even 24 hours before does not give me enough time to research, to understand. Uh, so I, I would just ask that we have more notice of these amendments so that they can be properly uh, scrutinized I, and vetted. Yeah, I propose that, yeah, I apologize. So, Commissioner Sorry Myron, I'm, I'm speaking, yeah. thank you, it's my turn. So. Um, it is, but okay. Okay, yes. but no, I just, I, as a courtesy, like, if we're gonna say we're gonna be transparent, then let's be transparent. And it goes, it goes for each and every one of us. So I would ask and expect that my fellow commissioners, as I will make every effort, if I have an amendment, it's really challenging. So we've just wasted an hour of time when I think all of this could have been, of what, we have these poor people that wanna bring a pro proclamation ahead and we're nowhere near being done. So anyway, I will, I will move on. I'll get back to where our conversation was because I do have some questions. Okay, so back to the task sites. Uh, one of the concerns I have around the Safe Rest Villages when we work with the city of Portland is that I'm told that the referrals to a Safe Rest village, village is made by the city of Portland. So for example, the Safe Rest Village on 122nd, there are many houseless individuals living near that site. But those folks living there don't have access to the Safe Rest Village. So I would like to see some type of uh, caveat, something that says uh, that there is a, a, a better system that addresses who and how people get revert or referred into those task sites. So, I don't know if, if any of you can answer that now, uh, so I'll give you that opportunity. Let me make a, uh, just a quick statement and then I don't know if Kanoi has a response to that or not. We just observe that you're not incorrect. Uh, the SRVs have <clears throat> sort of grown up over time under city leadership and there've been some gaps in the connection points well documented between the joint office and the SRVs. We are moving quickly to close those gaps. Uh, the chair staff and I are meeting regularly with city staff, the mayor's office, to understand and strengthen the connections between the joint office work and the SRVs, including the intake and the referral process. So I don't believe we have a uniform process right now for intake and referrals across all SRVs, but we're working in that direction. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna make a little point of clarification. It's our first responders as well as um, navigation workers that do that can refer in. And so we have one provider as an example that not only does it, they have a certain percentage that they can refer into their operated SRV and 75, and then another portion that is taken from our first responders, and that includes um, navigation workers from our three provider agencies at this moment. And so we actually hold the function of referring um, within the joint office. Uh, we have folks and we are contracting out to do that. And we work alongside the city of Portland and those first responders as well as our um, outreach providers. So it's actually a clarification point that we do have um, internal folks, uh, contracted providers, excuse me, that are able to refer in as well. It's a select group of those navigation workers. Okay. And so maybe I can get clarity from you on which site we're looking at and then be able to work um, on those folks that you're mentioning. And 
Yeah, so I mean, I, I, maybe it's, this is a different conversation, but mm -hmm. I would like to have a larger conversation to understand how the referrals work, because mm -hmm. this has ramifications when we look at uh, acquiring other properties and geographic equity. Like, we have to decide, like, are we going to uh, have services in one part of, of the city or the county, and yet the people that are living in that neighborhood don't have access to those resources? That's what I'm getting at. We can follow up for okay. sure on the referral process Thank and you, outline it for you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And do we know the locations of the TAS sites? Have those been determined? They have not. I don't think they've been finalized or publicized, but I, I we're looking at some other folks. If other folks have additional information, I have not been notified about the final selection. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm really concerned about. Uh, the, the timeline, uh, we've heard that it, it's taking a long time to get these sites up. So I would like to know, you know, when those sites plan on being up. I'd also like to know is who the service provider is and has, have they been selected? Do we know? Not to my understanding. No. Okay. So, I mean, I, I'm supportive of, of the cap, but these are the things that you want to see. This board needs to be updated on. Absolutely. that I would like to know. Uh, then going to the uh, capacity building, uh, I just don't think that, um, I, I, and, and I think um, Commissioner Brim Edwards brought up a good point, is that I think if we could clean up our terminology, because when we talk about rental assistance, like that's such a broad, like we need to be specifying, is it emergency? rental assistance, which my understanding is when you've received an eviction notice. Is it preventative rental assistance, where maybe you're just behind two or three months, but you haven't received an eviction notice? Or, you know, so whatever those, that, that terminology is, like, could we adopt that and could we use it and be more clear rather than just a large bucket? Yes, and I, if I can mention, I know the last time you had asked that question and we had focused primarily on those housing placements and we refined that proposal to be able to address the eviction prevention as well as um, new placements. But I hear you and what are the three definitions we use, short term, long term, and emergency. And so when we come with our proposals, how we can ensure that you, those are identified. And so yes, then I was you. confused too, because then I saw, I've heard of short term, long term, but then I saw medium. <laughs> What's medium? And that was my error, Commissioner. No, it's okay. I apologize. That, I, mean, I mean, does, I, it's short and medium. And I, what is the definition of short and medium then? Um, tw up to 24 months. And so when we think about long term, it's it's beyond the 24 months, like permanent supportive housing structures. Right. I misspoke earlier. Okay. Yeah. No, no worries. So I just, I think that's why we get confused because yes. you all are, I mean, you do this work every day and so you're grounded in it and, and we're not. So then when we hear these kind of interchangeable terms, uh, we get confused, at least I do. So no worries, Kanoi, thank you. Uh, the other thing uh, I really, I, I wanted to thank you for putting in all the metrics, and yes, that's absolutely what we want uh, when we're talking about the capacity building is knowing, you know, how many people did you retain? How many people did you hire? Um, I did have a question about when, w maybe it was in the slides, like I forgot, I don't know. Uh, when are these reports going to be required back to the county? The reports from the providers on the, how okay. they use the capacity building yes. grants. I don't know that we have that specified yet. Okay, so if we could get that timeline so we have a, a clear expectation, that, that would be great. Um, and then going to the employment, uh, so Dan, you said that uh, this money would be spread out throughout Multnomah County, so can you maybe talk to me about East Multnomah County around the employment portion? Right, I'm glad to share with you the proposal. It's not final, but we have a proposal. Uh, we shared that with Commissioner Brim Edwards from uh, Central City Concern for the coverage within the county. And it includes a specific geographic divided up um, among four different teams, um, including East County. Okay, so it will go out all the way? Yeah, these are, these are a little bit different than the, what you see downtown. These are mobile units, they'll, be, um, they'll have a designated uh, patrols, if you will, uh, uh, throughout the week, different sites each day. Um, and those four teams have been divided equally across the county. Okay, that's great. Uh, and, and I would ask, uh, because I think sometimes different commissioners get different information 
could there be some kind of a standard that if I ask a question or Commissioner Brim Edwards asks a question, could that be shared with the entire board? Is there any reason why we can't do that? We can do that, and just for clarification, we didn't share the central city concern proposal that outlines the four quadrants. We haven't shared that yet with, with anybody, so okay. we're glad to do that all at once. Okay, I just think it would save us all <laughs> a lot of questions and, and heartache and backtracking. Uh, okay, so I think uh, that, that was all my questions for now. So thank you all so much. I, I just want to appreciate, uh, I know you, you're, you're working hard and uh, you've been up before as many times and you will continue to be, but I do want to recognize the important work uh, that you've taken on, and I do appreciate it. So uh, we're gonna move on to public testimony. Thank you, um, I, before you leave though, I did wanna clarify about the task sites. So what we're doing with the CAF is obviously the capital investments for the for the pods, for some of the uh, buildings and facilities for um, the SRV. We have had commitment from the city, um, you know, as we were having the conversations about what these investments could be working with Metro to really make sure that we were being able to make investments that we would be able to get into get into implementation within the next year that that the commitment is to do this in the next fiscal year and I think that was part of your conversation that, that was part of the presentation that Kenoy um, gave as well so just to clarify I think we do have a proposal from at least one board member around funding the operations for the task sites with our unanticipated revenue so I think we can also follow up with some of the questions that you had Commissioner Stegman as we continue the conversation um, after you know after this around the unanticipated revenue and what operations may look like um, Commissioner Jayapal, did you have a follow-up? Oh, okay. My All right. about, I, I was going to follow up on Commissioner Stegman's question about timing of the, yeah. of the investment of the test site. Yes. So there is a finite yes. time frame. Yep. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yep. okay, thank you so much. We will now move to public testimony. So um, Tasha, can you share, how many folks do we have signed up? We have nine people signed up. Okay, so everyone can have two minutes for public testimony. Um, Oh, and we do have an elected official in the room who would like to testify, so don't, why don't we start with um, Commissioner Gonzalez, who's here. All right, we'll start with Commissioner Renee Gonzalez. Good morning. Sorry for the informality. I, you caught me on a bike ride uh, into the city today. We're gonna do a PSR ride along, so, uh, so happy to join you all today. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you for being here. So I am here uh, to speak on behalf uh, of Julia's proposed amendment, in particular support for Bybee Lakes and the city's uh, task sites. Um, I've had an opportunity to spend a good amount of time with the folks out at Bybee, um, and visited uh, it on a couple of occasions, uh, trauma-informed, holistic support, uh, synthesizing shelter, behavioral health, uh, as well as high expectations. And uh, I think it's a really positive path forward for our community as we confront these complex issues uh, associated with homelessness. Um, we've appreciated uh, increased support from the county on task sites and look forward uh, to future support there. Um, very happy with how things overall have pro progressed off of Powell. Um, we're spending close to 20 million on uh, task sites directly. This is a part of the city's $500 million uh, investment annually on the homeless challenge. This is a exploding part of our city budget. Uh, includes everything from direct response, uh, including shelter, uh, to, as well as certain indirect costs uh, associated with uh, cleanups and other supports that we're getting into. It does not include the cost to our 911 system, to public safety uh, and indirect costs on our BOAC and Portland fire. So we are investing substantial dollars in this area um, it, to do our part. And so any support we can receive uh, from the county is much, much uh, appreciated. Uh, one last plug here, um, we are, uh, the city stood up a program in Portland Street Response, uh, w uh, largely funded with ARPA and one-time dollars. We would uh, encourage you all to consider in the future fiscal year uh, uh, PSR's potential uh, uh, program to support uh, through the Joint Office on Homelessness. Uh, and with that, I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, love to hear any questions. I can't answer all the technical questions on the task sites, but uh, was asked to speak on behalf of the city, so I certainly can speak high level on any questions you might have. We really appreciate you being here, Commissioner Gonzalez, and appreciate your testimony today. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, next, we have Cole Merkel and Andrew Hound. So 
Good morning. Good morning. Chair Vega Peterson, commissioners. For the record, my name's Cole Merkel. I use he, him, and his pronouns, and I'm one of the co-directors at Here Together. I'm here to testify in support of several of the priorities in the corrective action plan that are outlined in the 2023 Here Together roadmap. First, and very briefly, just thank you for including both client rent assistance and the employment programs in the cap. We can prevent people's homelessness much faster if they're not becoming homeless in the first place, and the employment services will help keep our city clean. But I do wanna talk about the key priority in the roadmap, which is to grow and retain our workforce. And that's why I'm urging you to immediately pass the $10 million in community capacity building grants. While working on the front lines of homelessness can be rewarding, it involves long, demanding hours to support people in crisis, making do on shoestring budgets, and earning low to modest wages. I was in direct service for eight years. This is personal for me, too. These factors are contributing to a major labor shortage that is adding pressure on an already exhausted workforce. The clearest and most recent example of these challenges can be found in the Joint Office Classification, Compensation, and Benefit Study. In that report, 78% of employees surveyed said they would leave their current organization for increased salaries elsewhere, and 86% said the highest priority change they would make to their organization is increased pay. In that study, there are dozens of anecdotes that illustrate the challenges we hear from homeless service providers in our coalition every day. For example, the worker who shared how their pay is not commensurate with their time and skill that they put in. They said, quote, with the cost of living having taken on, a, uh, many have taken on a third job because their current pay at this job isn't enough to keep things afloat. No one doing the life-saving work of solving people's homelessness should have to make the gut-wrenching decision between buying groceries or paying rent. Today, you have the opportunity to make tangible changes in the lives of our frontline workers and fundamentally shift the way our region addresses this crisis. And so please vote yes on that $10 million package and get the funds out into the hands of our nonprofits. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Andrew Hone, President and CEO of the Portland Metro Chamber. We're part of the affiliate families of the Chamber, Downtown Portland Clean and Safe, and Partners in Diversity. And I'm here to urge you to support several of the proposed allocations within the Joint Office of Homeless Services Supplemental Budget Modification. Of course, just to reiterate, absolute clear support for making sure that our frontline workers are appropriately compensated. And in the spirit of the amendments offered, we think the pairing of significant reform to the contracting services of the county and the joint office is absolutely critical. These two combined will make it possible for our frontline providers to have access to the resources in a quick, expedient way and to have clear and transparent contracts. Secondly, I would urge you to also support the proposed $4.7 million to support the purchase of 140 pods and RV vehicles parking program for two sites as part of the City of Portland's temporary alternative safe shelter sites. This $4.7 million is a first step in the county to become a full partner in the critical task sites program and I call on you today to provide that additional $16 million in ongoing operation costs for the two task sites when you finalize your plan. I want to additionally communicate some clear priorities from the Chamber of Commerce. Bybee Lakes Hope Center, absolutely critical partner in the homeless services continuum, and we simply cannot afford to lose the shelter services that they offer and to see those go offline. Lastly, and most importantly, I want to make sure and crystal clear that you finalize plans to spend the roughly $100 million in underspent and unanticipated SHH funds from the business community's most urgent priority is the allocation of 15 to 20 million dollars for the reestablishment of the drop-off sobering center. The loss of the Hooper detoxification sobering center in 2019 can be seen on our streets every single day. And as you know, the fentanyl crisis on our streets is the single biggest threat to the vibrancy in downtown Portland and the city as a whole. Last week, we held a conversation with Health Justice Recovery and Panel on Measure 110 funded service providers looking for common ground. And one of the key areas of agreement is that the under state law of public intoxication is still an arrestable offense, but we cannot possibly expect law enforcement officials to enforce this law if they do not have a fully staffed facility to take individuals to sober up and help to recover. This Thank is you. absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, Andy Miller joining virtually. Andy, you can unmute yourself and begin. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm Andy Miller. I'm the Executive Director of Our Just Future. 
We provide a continuum of responses to homelessness, including shelters, supportive housing, and employment programming centered in East Portland and Gresham. I'm here this morning to support the CAP and especially the capacity grants. As you know from the recent audit, comp study, and from testimony this morning, thank you, Commissioner Jayapal, especially for your poignant testimony, um, providers are struggling to hire and to operate um, with inadequate staffing levels because contract revenues have histor historically run below what's needed to fund livable wages. This underfunding puts our whole homeless system and the people it supports at great risk. We often struggle to meet the minimum thresholds every evening for staffing each of our three shelters, and we've gone too many months with major vacancies in most of our housing programs. The effect of this is that it burns out staff, and it leaves people waiting longer than they should to receive the help they need and deserve. Over half our employees tell us they cannot meet their family's basic needs on the salaries they earn, and our employee emergency fund, which we had to create to mitigate financial emergencies confronting our team members, gets fully drawn down prematurely every fiscal year. These are simply untenable conditions for organizations uh, that this commission and our community relies upon to solve our most critical public policy issue. We're grateful for the 8% COLA this commission awarded in the current budget year, but it's important to note that that percentage was not awarded to all funding sources administered in our county contracts, and too many of our contracts underfund our administrative overhead, which pays for essential fiscal and contract compliance functions. We support an allocation formula for these grants that factors in wage differentials, underfunded overhead, and makes whole those sources that were not awarded the full county COLA. We know you all understand this issue well. We've spoken to each of you. Our shared goal of a high-performing system relies on the great people who do the critical work I'm... every day and night. And we urge you to invest the full $10 million in front of you today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Laura... Galena De Lovato, who is also joining um, virtually. You may begin, Laura. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Chair Vega Peterson and commissioners. My name is Laura Galeno De Lovato. I'm the Executive Director of Northwest Pilot Project. We work in Multnomah County to help extremely low income and vulnerable older adults to find housing and navigate the often complex system of accessing rental housing. We don't own or operate housing, so it's important to us that we build uh, networks throughout the community with housing providers and with other service providers. I'm testifying today in uh, support of the uh, Corrective Action Plan, and especially in support of the $10 million allocation for capacity building grants. Uh, as my colleague Andy Miller said, the sector has been struggling to meet uh, the wage needs of our employees to be able to attract and retain the best um, staff that we can. The work that we do at Northwest Pilot Project, it really is social work. And that word social is really key. We build relationships with our clients and depend on those relationships for uh, successful outcomes, i.e. long-term stable housing for our clients. The capacity building dollars that would be allocated to us through these grants would allow us to um, increase wages, to have some um, uh, better retention mechanisms and potentially increase our capacity to be a stronger partner uh, in the community and ultimately serve more seniors. We are as supportive of a transparent and clear allocation process um, and are looking forward to uh, learning more about Time. those details. And we're also um, supportive of metrics. Thank you. Um, next, we have um, Charles Bridgegreen Johnson, Scott Moore, uh, and Aaliyah. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. You've probably heard of a death by a thousand cuts 
it's just a phrase, in Multnomah, we have death by 39 community-based organizations. Um, oops, it's 40 community-based organizations because we're gonna make Bybee Lakes part of the pool. There's, we don't, like, who, I, uh, cultivate initiatives, who is one? Is Transition Projects a community-based organization? Nobody knows. Um, we get some teeny weird numbers about people have gone into housing, and then uh, when we were at slide 10, uh, we had a planned failure rate of 20%. I don't know if any of you all heard that. We, we plan on retention of 80%. Eh, okay, maybe there's a system of guesstimating how many people we house can retain their housing. But it's not encouraging to come in here and see that the plan is a 20% failure rate. Um, I think that the community, taxpayers, constituents, when they hear 39 community-based organizations are doing stuff while we've been watching getting it worse, they're very skeptical that giving those community organizations $10 million to improve their HR services and their wages are going to move the needle. That's what we as citizens want to see. So we want to see consistent, reliable moving of the needle and a really plan that says that that's gonna work. Um, and if you're gonna have, if you, what you have to tell us is like, hey community, we're just gonna fund 39 community-based organizations. Please make it easy for us to know their names, whether they have 95 employees, which is what I think the joint office has. I have no idea how many employees Transition Projects has. How do they scale their HR? It's not working, um, and it's not just because those frontline workers are underpaid. So give it more thought. Find the million dollars to fund a study. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Aliyah Mays. I live in Old Town Chinatown. Um, I'm definitely in favor of you guys increasing people's pay because I know that it's the people that are on the ground that are seeing the worst of things. It's not Carmen Rubio who is seeing people that have been destroyed by drugs and have open sores and is cleaning their wounds. These people that are doing this work, they deserve every dollar that they get and some. Um, I do want to say that I do think it is very important to keep track of what the stats are on who's actually housing people and where the money is going. I have concerns about where some of these places are going though too, like in places of my neighborhood. Some of these tiny villages are low barrier, which brings more drug addicts that are actively using to our neighborhoods. I think that we need to be mindful of that. And I still don't understand why with all of this money we still have not erected large utility tents with around the clock Narcotics Anonymous meetings as in a form of emergency detox to at least sweep these people in so that they have some place to go and can get drug treatment in the, what is it, three years now that they've been waiting for detox centers to be built? I mean, if military personnel can be in these tents, for years at a time, I don't think that it's unreasonable to think that taking people off of the street and moving them there until we can get a more brick and mortar place for them to be. I mean, I just think that we could be doing better with the things that we're doing and we need to like really focus on not just getting people the pay that they need but also not increasing management's uh, the people that manage these places, not increasing their income. But I don't know, I'm just like, like I'm sorry, was that you who said that? Somebody said something about we're all sketchy. We're very sketchy about anything y'all say at this point, and Thank I think y'all know why. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, last, we have lightning. Oh, we have one more. Oh, oh, just kidding, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, go ahead, it happens. <laughs> um. Hi, I'm just going to jump right into it. My name is Scott Moore with Quest Center for Integrative Health. Um, so in regards to the cap capacity building um, conversation that's been going on for uh, since Tuesday, uh, which I listened to with great interest, I, 
I just think I have to say that um, no discussion on wages in behavioral health or, or social services is, um, or in healthcare is complete without including the conversation around rates. Rates, rates, rates. I didn't hear anybody talk about the word rates and it missed, I wanted to jump up like Dorma Ray and scream rates. Anyways, the rates in the nonprofit sectors for services uh, from insurance companies, including Oregon Health Authority, providers beneath the health share umbrella, private insurance companies such as the nonprofit Prize of Permanente, the United Healthcare, or frankly, Multnomah County General Funds and CBOs such as TPI. Simply put, higher rates equal higher wages. The nonprofit, the nonprofit sector in Multnomah County has been tasked with caring for both the physical and behavioral health of the most vulnerable and marginalized people living in the county. The board should prioritize all funding policy and decisions to building capacity for community-based organs to bill wherever possible for their services, primarily through frontline assistance programs built to maintain their existing, building to maintain people living in their existing situation and circumstances primarily to be able to bill through the Oregon Health Plan, Medicaid, also to be able to receive services through long-term supportive housing, housing services, such as long-term rental assistance, not the short-term. Those are important. Those would be the secondarily importantly things to be able to fund and have build policies through, specifically through continued and long-term support of the Measure 110 Behavioral Health Resource Networks. Do not allow that to be taken away simply because people are upset about the on-street that is also that is a huge problem and what this man had to say from the from the chamber it's true let's all work together as community-based organizations and business to really control that problem and what this woman here had to say yes build tents get things ready help people have immediate services to be able to have uh, NA meetings right away Thank but you. you know let's get these things done tertiary immediate things so yeah. Thank you. There are things that can get done. Uh, last up, we have lightning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Humanity X. Actually, on the SHS measure, I'm really, uh, I've been very pleased so far up to this point. And again, uh, I approve of what you're trying to do on the capacity building grants. I think Commissioner Jayapal brought up some really good points today. Otherwise, I was kind of on the fence on this, but as of this time, after listening to her points, I'm absolutely for this. Uh, again, uh, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez came in on the Portland Street response. Uh, I really hope that you're gonna end up funding that. Again, I've asked for five million one time only, and then again, five million ongoing on the Portland Street response. Again, when we've mentioned Bybee Lakes, all I really think about on Bybee Lakes and Wapato Jail is when Jordan Snitzer ended up buying that property, and now we're having discussions on continuing. In my opinion, he's followed through with everything he stated. I've met with Jordan Snitzer on, well, with a property in the past called Linden Farms. I tried to actually sell that property to him. And the reality is, is that when Jordan Snitzer says something, it gets done. If Jordan Snitzer is involved in a project, his word is all he would need to say to me to know that it's gonna be done right. And that is who he is. And again, when you're talking Bybee Lakes and him following through on what he said he would do with that property, although Mar Marty Kehoe ended up buying it first, transferring it to Jordan Snitzer, uh, the reality is he's followed through with everything he stated he would do. And as far as funding an organization like that, you don't even need a third party to analyze that. Thank you. If Jordan Snitzer's involved, it gets done right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you for the board comments to, or for the um, public testimony today on this measure. We will go to the board for final um, comments and we will start with, I believe it's Commissioner Brim, Brim Edwards' turn to step for us. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I, I just, before I give my final comments, I just wanted to, to my uh, fellow colleagues, I uh, apologize if you got my amendments late. Um, 
two things happening. I'm learning how the system works, but also um, if I think you'll find um, I will be offering amendments in the future and not because I disagree, but sometimes I have something additional that I might want to add or, or amend. And um, it also requires then us getting our underlying documents so that we know what it is that we're voting on and whether um, it actually addresses the issues um, we thought was addressing. So um, I apologize to the commissioners for getting that late. And I, uh, again, appreciate the conversation I had this morning. Um, and I would ask in the future, so we have we have a process that we get our the documents um, early and that we can then have those conversations and that they're not, don't all get compressed. Um, with that, I want to say that I am going to be supporting these investments this morning um, because it makes important moves and takes action on three areas I think are critically important as we decide how we're going to make meaningful impact across our community relative to the um, very uh, generous amount of SHS funds that this county has to um, disperse. So first, um, as I said many times, I'm very supportive of the county funding. Uh, for 200 additional shelter beds through our support of the two temporary alternative shelter beds um, or shelter sites that the um, city is standing up. Um, it's important, um, I look at District 3, um, it's important that those sites get set up. Um, there is unsanctioned camping um, and people without basic services um, throughout our, um, throughout District 3 and a heavy concentration in a lot of the natural areas in the eastern portion of, of District 3. So um, I'm supportive of moving ahead as quickly as possible with standing up on the shelter sites and providing support, um, as I think that those sites are going to immediately help people transition from the streets to having basic services, stability, safety, and getting them on their way. And I really appreciate um, the partnership with the city. I think it's um, a, a good model for us. Um, we both have an interest in, um, in changing uh, what, what's happening on, on the streets. And I appreciate uh, Commissioner Gonzalez uh, coming here this morning and, and speaking to that, to, to that partnership and hope it's ongoing. Secondly, um, I also wanna speak to my um, appreciation uh, for the geographic parity and their approach to the Clean Start program. Uh, many business districts and neighborhoods in District 3 um, would benefit from the trash cleanup, graffiti removal, and other services that are going to be um, provided for that um, through that investment. Also, the um, workforce development connection is a really important component to it as well, so that um, individuals um, who haven't don't have a work history um, or who have now have had stabilization, been stabilized through some sort of housing or temporary shelter, um, that they can start work and employment and get, on, get back into um, the workforce and meaningful employment. Um, in addition, uh, for the third, the third reason I'm gonna be supporting today's package is this action incorporates greater transparency both with the board and our community um, with the metrics that are, um, that have been established and it's gonna allow us to, I believe, take um, necessary steps to evaluate um, whether our investments are doing what we intended them to do and whether we should be doubling down or modifying or doing something differently. Um, so I I'm, think this is, it's an important milestone to be adding those investments at, at the front end that we all have seen them and agree to them and then uh, to get regular reporting. So um, with that, I, for those three reasons, um, I'm gonna be supporting this, this morning's uh, investments package that's been brought forward. Thank you, um, Commissioner Verma Edwards. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for uh, the discussion about the amendments. And I know that the board will be having a retreat later in October. And so I'm hoping we can talk about what a, an appropriate timeline to receive those amendments in advance uh, at that meeting. But uh, just so you all know, if I don't receive an amendment within 24 hours at least before the board meeting, uh, I'm not gonna have enough time to uh, entertain it. So I, at a minimum, as a courtesy, I would ask for at least 24 hours and look forward to having a, a deeper discussion at our board retreat. Um, I, I, you know, we've been really in the weeds and it's a good thing. 
Uh, but what's re really exciting is that really we have never been so united as jurisdictions, as a community, as uh, the business community, nonprofits, providers. Uh, so this is really, uh, I, I think, an important moment in time for us to recognize. And you know, we always talk about, quote, the pathway out of poverty. And sometimes that's, it doesn't ring, <laughs> it's a little bit hollow. Uh, but I think that the investments that are on the table today actually do provide a pathway out of poverty. Rental assistance uh, and the workforce opportunity is so vital and I'm really pleased to hear that there is gonna be geographic equity in East Multnomah County. So I look forward to hearing more about that. And the, the tasks, uh, you know, we've heard the community complain about uh, the disharmony between the city of Portland and Multnomah County. Uh, please, we are working side by side with the city of Portland. So uh, we have listened to our community and uh, we will continue to do that and work in partnership with anybody who wants to move forward and have significant solutions uh, as we address homelessness. And finally, uh, the capacity uh, for the organizations. I mean, I'm really, really excited, although I do want to remind folks that this is simply a down payment. Like there is and should be and will be more to come. To me, it is just a show of good faith that we say to our providers, look, we recognize the challenges with workforce that you all have and that we are committed and that you are the foundation of how we're going to reduce homelessness in our community. So I am uh, very pleased to support uh, the CAP spending and I wanna thank everyone who's worked so hard. And Chair, again, I wanna really appreciate your leadership and your transparency and it through, through this entire process. Uh, it's been really refreshing and appreciated. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Myron. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, just briefly, I, I appreciated Commissioner Brim Edwards' points um, that that she made earlier uh, and uh, requesting clarity about some of the procedures. And I, I apologize similarly to um, particularly uh, Commissioner Stegman. I know that um, recognizing you need that uh, additional time and uh, I have made the proposal for quite some time and have been speaking with with you all about it. And so I and we were informed by the chair's office we could make amendments. Uh, and so I put all of that together in coming this morning with that amendment. But um, I think it will be a good opportunity to have the board retreat and to um, have some clarity and uh, standardization for processes and procedures, uh, which has been missing for far too long. Um, I, I will be voting no on the cap today, and it is for reasons of both process and substance. Um, I, I feel that despite lofty goals that I absolutely support, the, the language used, the way of reaching some of those are pulled from uh, really what I consider the playbook of the status quo. And it's about urgently spending money versus meaningfully acting and showing uh, requiring uh, measurable outcomes. And it, I think about the big categories of dysfunction the joint office audit highlighted around accountability, data and analy analytics and transparency and and the cap for me had them all. Um, and uh, I recognize this sounds like a very a, a very different experience from uh, Commissioner Stegman, but for me, from the beginning, I didn't learn of the cap uh, until I read about it. Um, when I did learn about it, it was presented as a done deal with um, negotiation performed behind closed doors and finalized even before the board uh, approved the spending, which which seemed 
backwards to me. And although we were informed initially, I, I was told it was a done deal and the spending plan was the spending plan. Then we were told we could theoretically change the cap, but it would be sort of difficult. It would be best if we didn't. And now here we are and we're voting on exactly what was proposed. And we we say, well, it's, it's not perfect or it, it has these really great goals. Um, and it's only a small amount of money compared to the, un, the uh, unanticipated revenue which we can do a deal with in a couple of weeks. But for me, $17 million is not a small sum. And the vast majority of that substantial sum will be spent on capacity building. Um, Commissioner Brim Edwards uh, alluded to being new, on, new to the board. And uh, so I can understand not having been on the board for six years, hearing similar words being used in similar context in the past and resulting in essentially a giveaway of tens of millions of dollars. Um, this was borne out in the audience. I sincerely hope I will be proven wrong and that I will see robust outcomes and demonstrations of how effective this $17 million have been, particularly the $10 million for capacity building. But I've gotten to the point where I can trust but verify. Um, and so I'm, I will await that verification. Um, in you know, I spoke to process, but the, the areas that provided challenge were number one, capacity building and Again, the audit alluded to the investments in our community-based organizations. And I truly support the organizations and we need to create the systems in which they function most effectively and where they can be supported and where they can get the money that they need to invest most effectively in their people and organizations, but I do not see that in this in this cap. Again, hopefully something will prove me wrong here, and I hope the organizations do get what they need. Um, shelter capacity. I I have been arguing for a robust shelter ecosystem with alternative shelter for for ages and including larger campsites, uh, sanctioned sites, small camp, like thinking outside the box. So, and I absolutely support the task, but I'm the, the process around making the decision of how much and how to spend that on the, the pods and was not, um, was not in a way that I felt that it was giving me the specific information needed to say, oh, this is the best use of the cap underspent funds. Um, so I hope I support the task again. I hope that this will lead to in significantly increased shelter capacity, but recognizing it's still, even the task is a drop in the bucket. And and so for all of these rent assistants I've spoken to raise some major audit concerns about how we even understand where that money is going, who's getting that money, um, where the retention is, how we even think about doing retention since this is one time only. We don't, we don't have the systems in place and we have a proven track record of failing to use this money effectively. And so the rent assistance, I have similar concerns. In a world where, again, um, too often uh, we're, we're governed by the, 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 the press release, um, rather than the depth and analysis that needs to go into all of these decision makings, uh, these decisions, I do want to be clear that 
I support CBOs hugely. I support the tasks. I support Clean Start. Um, I know rental assistance is a fundamental component of an effective uh, solution to a homelessness continuum. But I believe the cap as written is fundamentally flawed. It is about spending funds as quickly as possible, which is the way it's always been, rather than a plan for responsibly using taxpayer dollars. And, and so with respect to my colleagues and appreciation um, of the chair and all the, the people and teams who and all the advocates, one way or another, um, I will be voting no. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Jayapal, I know you already had your comments. I, I do have a couple more comments, Chair. Okay. okay. Um, and Briefly, you know, I, we, we I will are, just we, refer anyone who's coming in at the end of the session to the fact that I made comments out of order. I apologize. <laughs> they are earlier. So if you didn't hear them, please go rewind, listen to them. Um, I do want to say a couple things about process. Uh, I, too, am looking forward to the retreat because I think there are some issues that we need to iron out and that we can improve so that this board functions at its highest um, and best capacity. So I'm looking forward to that. In terms of the process with the cap, I, I just want to say that for my part, it has been clear from the beginning that although uh, the cap was negotiated between Metro and the chair's office, as is required and set out by the IGA, that the board, this board has always had the power and today has the power to vote not to approve it. So and that was a point that I actually um, called out for the support of Housing Services Oversight Committee so that they were clear also on the fact that the fact that something is negotiated by the chair and by Metro doesn't deprive this board of its power to approve a budget modification and to approve the spending of the funds. So that's, that's it on the process. And then on the substance, I do wanna say there are without a doubt any number of systems issues that need to be improved. There is without a doubt um, additional investigation, data analysis, outcome measurement that needs to be done, and it is an emergency. And so we are in a position where we have to take action simultaneously with continuously iterating a process. We can't stop in order to wait to get put, put, put the ideal systems into place. So, you know, I really always uh, appreciate my colleagues' comments. I think I think we've gotten to a better place on this cap as a consequence of all of our participation, and I appreciate the chair and the chair's office and your leadership to get us here. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner. So I just really briefly, and because we are we are so far behind time, and we have people who have been waiting for a couple of really important items still on our agenda. Um, so I think people should just plan that we are going to be here till one o'clock. Um, I will say that. Um, we have, um, for me, there were a couple of key points in, in putting together this, um, this cap proposal, the use of the underspending. One, you know, was in the conversations. This was a negotiation between um, the county and Metro, according to the IGA. And, you know, their concern, as well as mine, was making sure that these dollars that were supposed to be used in our community in the last fiscal year were able to be put out into the community in a, uh, in a very timely manner while also having the impact on the crisis that we need to see. So in considering what these investments should be, it was listening to our partners, listening to stakeholders, listening to other jurisdictions about the most critical needs right now in our community. That is why we are investing in partnership with the city for capital for the next two task sites, which we know makes a significant difference in providing people who are currently living unsheltered on the streets safety and stability. That is why we are investing in capacity building for our providers, because they have been saying, we want to do the work that you have given us. We are in a crisis right now with our workforce. We are in a crisis right now with retention. We are in a crisis with being able to, um, to function in the way to do that. So that capacity building grants was directly related to, to the calls that we have heard from them and other community members around that need. In a similar way, we know that we want to make this county, this city, a place that uh, is beautiful and livable and we all um, are proud to be a part of. And we also know that we wanna give people that next step in their path to stability and recovery 
um, and housing, and employment is an incredible way to do that. So um, bringing together those, you know, those concepts with um, the investment employment programs was was a really wonderful way to do that. And again, I'm really glad that this is being matched by a one million dollar investment at the state to to increase the um, the power of the investment that this board is going to be making. And then finally, rental assistance. We know that so many people are are continuing to live on the edge when it comes to um, eviction risk and comes to being able to have the resources to even move into permanent housing. That's why the move in dollars, getting ready to be housing, um, getting ready um, for housing and, and being successful in your applications, providing the short and medium term assistance is very critical now, especially as the ARP dollars moving away. For all of those things, you know, I was really proud to put this forward. I appreciate the dialogue and the um, uh, communication um, that we've had on the board, it, it, the the conversations we've had have had a very real impact in how these um, investments are moving forward and what they look like and how we're going to be measuring and talking about them going forward. So I appreciate that. Finally, I will just say that with this investment that we're making, with the $40 million that we did in the budget, with the entire um, budget of the joint office that we passed in June, we have to be looking at all of these things holistically and making sure that the impacts we want from the investments we're making today, the investments that we previously made, the investments that we're going to be making in the next few weeks are really having that impact. And I think that is um, the desires on the board. It is incumbent on our board to be watchful of that. And that's the expectations we have for the joint office as well as providing us that information. Um, so with that, um, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. I'll come back. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Burm Edwards? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Myron? Uh, Chair Vega Peterson? Uh, Commissioner Myron, are you able to unmute? Aye. The supplemental budget modification is approved. All right, so we are going to, um, we are at lunchtime. We have two uh, more things to consider today. One is a proclamation that is regularly scheduled. We also have um, something that we are going to consider by emergency because people for the proclamation have been waiting a very long time. We are going to move to the proclamation and then we will consider um, uh, something by emergency. So with that, can we move on to R2? R2. Infant Mortality Awareness Month Proclamation. Yes. Yeah. So moved. Second. Uh, Commissioner Dial Paul moves. Commissioner um, Segment seconds. Approval of R2. All right. So thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate um, the chance to have this proclamation um, in recognition of Infant Mortality Awareness Month. And I'm very grateful for all the presenters who are here today. Um, for being here and for being incredible advocates for the community um, around this topic. So thank you for all of that. I think whether you're a parent or not, infant mortality touches and impacts all of us. We know infant mortality is disproportionately higher among black, African-American, and native indigenous infants in Multnomah County, which means we have to do better on this. We have to expect more of, um, of how we're able to show up for those communities. The health disparities reflect persistent and systemic, as well as individual social disparities, including within our healthcare system and delivery of medical care. Notably, for black and African American infants, parental education and income do not serve as protective factors against infant mortality. This underscores the need for more comprehensive and accessible health care for pregnant and immediately postpartum people, including dismantling systems and processes that perpetually um, perpetuate medical racism and discrimination. Investing in the health and well being of pregnant people leads to healthier infant outcomes, including increased birth weight and reducing the risk of preterm delivery, which is why our health department and partners are focused on expanding what pregnancy and postpartum care includes to ensure that all people have affordable, easy access to doula and lactation care. We invest in these programs because they are our best chance to impact what's possible for people creating families in Multnomah County. Because we know that investing in this care for parents is an investment in healthy, thriving future for all of our children. I'm pleased to turn this presentation over to Deisha Reed Holden from our Healthy Birth Initiative Program. Thank you for being here, Deisha, and for your help in bringing forward today's proclamation. Thank you. Good morning. 
Good morning. Or good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, do we have our slides? Thank you. Thank you, you can go to the next slide. Um, so <clears throat> September is Infant Mortality Awareness Month and um, Healthy Birth Initiatives is one of the 101 Healthy Start programs across the country. And so we were established to reduce infant mortality here in Multnomah County. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so five of the leading causes of infant death are birth defects, preterm and low birth weight, sudden infant death syndrome, injuries, and maternal pregnancy complications. And so of these five, um, two through five are things that we can actually address within our community by putting the right supports in place for our families. Next slide, please. Um, so adverse birth outcomes by race um, in Multnomah County specifically. Would you mind stating your name for the record? Thank you so much. I'm know sorry. who you are. But I apologize. Um, my name is Chantel Reed. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I am the interim deputy director of health for uh, the health department. I apologize. I've been here. I've been um, paying attention and readily excited. Um, I'm so happy to be here today um, to talk about this very important issue. Um, but adverse outcomes specifically by race and ethnicity um, severely impact um, those individuals um, um, and persons um, uh, in the African American, Black, and uh, Native uh, American communities, uh, low birth in weight and uh, preterm birth weight. Um, Pre-birth, um, preterm birth, specifically in African American men, uh, African American women, 12.4 times. Um, amongst women over a, a short range of time. Uh, infant death uh, in African American women and uh, um, Native American women also are exacerbated in those areas. Deisha. Next slide, please. And so when we talk about um, education and income not being enough, um, educated, education and income are usually indicators of whether or not someone has Medicaid or private insurance. Um, and so with that, we can see that a black mother with a master's or a doctorate is likely to have a birth outcome in regards to preterm or um, low birth weight that is um, close to a white high school graduate. And this is data that was um, shared just this year at a national level. Next slide, please. And so what we know that um, that reduces or reduces and eliminates risk for our families are having um, birth and postpartum doulas and lactation support. So on this particular slide, um, we have information about how some of our families have shared what their experience were with having doulas, particularly culturally congruent doulas um, that provided support for them around their um, pregnancy and postpartum time, including um, education about breastfeeding, um, safe sleep, which we know reduces the risk of SIDS. Both breastfeeding and safe sleep reduce the risk of SIDS. And we don't have to talk too much about breastfeeding since I know you guys just did the World Breastfeeding Proclamation a few weeks ago. Um, but even down to supporting parents, moms and dads, um, and, and creating birth plans and things like that that we know statistically improve outcomes. Um, doulas are instrumental in being able to provide uh, support that reduces the need for um, interventions during birth that can impact um, the well-being of the infant and the mother after birth. And we can go to the next slide. And so around lactation, we also have quotes here from, um, from families who shared about getting lactation support. And one of the big things that came out of these conversations was the ability to have someone who can come to their home. That's what community-based lactation counselors do. It's the resource that they give, similar to that of a doula. Um, and while we know that um, having a doula alone, even if they're not trained to provide lactation support, is something that statistically has been proven to um, increase the rate of breastfeeding initiation in families. 
we know that it's important for families to have the support that they need to continue for as long as they want to or as long as they can with breastfeeding. Um, it's beneficial for mom and beneficial for baby. Um, and research is still coming up to show how long the benefits last in regards to breastfeeding. And so um, when we look at what the benefits of having a lactation counselor are, they include um, having help with meeting your goals based on where you are, providing education and creating a breastfeeding plan similar, similar to the, similarly to the way that you would create a, um, a birth plan in advance to make sure that you have all of the um, pieces in place that you need to have the experience that you're striving for. Next slide, please. So um, normally when we come and do our proclamation each year, we share about the work that HBI is doing to reduce infant mortality in our community. But this year we really wanted to emphasize what we know to be the gaps. And um, those gaps include um, not having um, adequate access to doula and lactation support. We are indeed Multnomah County employees, and so we get off at a certain time. But we know that our families need that support around the clock um, in a way that we cannot provide. And so um, through our program and building partnerships with other community organizations, we have been able to partner more of our parents with doulas, and it's been great for our Medicaid population. However, um, because black moms and babies um, don't have the protective factor of education and income, and we do serve all people um, regardless of their income in healthy birth initiatives. We know that um, access to doula and lactation support for our private insured families is still a huge barrier. And since their outcomes without support especially are similar to that of white women who um, have just finished high school, even when they have advanced degrees, we know that it's not enough for um, for just our Medicaid population to be able to have access to doula support. Most pregnancies around the world are still unplanned. And so people are indeed figuring out, um, moving things around to accommodate a new life coming into their families in a lot of cases. Um, and so with that, the, the cost barrier of needing to pay $1,500, two or $3,000 for a doula um, can be a huge barrier, but everyone deserves to have that support, not just black moms. Everyone deserves to have the support um, in order to be able to have a healthy birthing experience and a healthy postpartum experience and breastfeeding experience that will empower them to be able to feed their babies for as long as they can or as long as they desire to do so. And so um, we do a lot of systems advocacy um, work and outreach within healthy birth initiatives through our case managers, through um, our program coordinators and our program specialists. And so with that, we do encourage our families to, um, to, to get doulas. We do partner them with doulas. We are constantly working to, to find new ways to be able to fill that gap for our private pay. But we, we need help with that. Um, we need help um, with that. And we know that with the Medicaid, um, with the Medicaid insurance, being in place now, we see that there's room for us to expand to be able to make sure that all families have access to this without cost being such a huge barrier as it is today. Um, and so some of what we have been doing through Healthy Birth Initiatives um, is working to figure out what we can do and what we can support that will allow us to improve outcomes for all families. Um, because if if black families have um, the widest disparities, we know that anything that benefits our community is gonna benefit every community across the board, and that's what we're striving for. Next slide, please. All right, yeah, a hello and good afternoon, um, Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about the recognition of infant mortality awareness. My name is Ashley Kuhn. I am Danae from New Mexico. I am with Chagu Monkeyush, a Future Generations Collaborative Program, FGC, and I'm here to talk about the importance of native culturally specific programming, such as Chagu Monkeyush. Next slide, please. As most of you already know, the FGC is a collective impact partnership between native and native serving organizations, tribes, community members, education institutions, and systems. Together, we address public health issues impacting the native community with a culturally con congruent trauma and healing informed approach. FGC's collective impact seeks to promote family well being and connection through traditional means. Families are offered well rounded workshops and gatherings aiming to promote safety, knowledge, and wisdom around prenatal and infant care.
It is the combination of collaboration and care that strengthened the health of our Indigenous families. We are so grateful to Multnomah County and the Health Department for making investments into the community like this. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. For recognizing the need for cultural programming. Because of partnerships like these, we were able to receive funding for Chagumon Kilush and its expansion. We hope that with continued funding into the expansion of this project, we are able to carry on with the important work. Chagu Monkithush is a future generation collaborative's own trauma and healing informed implementation of the National Help Me Grow program that is specially geared toward our native cultural needs and traditional practices. Our structure continues to adjust to meet the needs of the community through referral networking, direct family support, and system navigation. As native people, we are proud respectful, resilient, and strong. We draw strength from our traditional practices and value those in our community as relatives. To support these values and cherished ties, we offer a holistic approach where we, where we prioritize family well-being through the relationship of connection and collaboration. Our direct family support nourishes and uplifts families through two means, weekly connect and play circles, which are our family play groups, and through one-on-one -on -one support. These two modes contribute to supportive factors such as community engagement, peer connections, early detection and developmental screening, concrete support, social emotional competence, supporting values and beliefs, protecting and honoring culture, a safe environment, respect, and nurturing mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional health. In supporting family well being, we also want to ensure providers are aware of the importance of cultural congruence practices when working within Native and Indigenous communities. Our model also allows us to build in and upon programs cultural awareness, which better supports access and breaks down barriers and pre that prevent families from receiving the care they need and want. Our team currently partners with providers such as NEA, WIC, FGC, Multnomah County Library, and other community providers, all seeking to build successful circles of care for families. We meet with our partners through two modes. First, providers join us and play at our connect and play circles. When present, providers are building direct relationship with families, leading to more trust and familiarity. Secondly, we meet monthly for the latest news on programs, events, gatherings, and ways to identify new resources for families. This type of connection and collaborative relationship shows our families that we care. We hear their wants and needs. We uplift their voices. We want everyone we collaborate with, families, community members, and partner providers, to feel invested in ensuring families with young Native children are receiving safe, quality and equitable health care to help with preventative measures. Cultural programming is a must. Again, thank you for your recognition and continued support. We're greatly appreciated. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to say um, we know that a healthy baby starts with a healthy family and if we give families healthy starts and we give them all the support that they need um, we know that this will build healthy communities um, the importance of raising awareness for uh, infant mortality really builds on us being able to support like where we go on the foundation support of, our, of who we are as a community um, when Deisha first came to me and she said, listen, we want to be able to do this because we want to be able to build some pillars and be able to provide like longer sustaining support in our community, I said, absolutely, I support it. As a doula myself, when she raised awareness that um, doulas in our community are supported by OHP, but they're not supported by private insurance. This was something that we really needed to elevate and we wanted to make sure that we raised uh, to the attention. So staff members of the county um, would not have those services accessible to them. Um, so this was something that we wanted to say, like, listen, we need to shout it from the rooftops. We would need people to understand that being able to have that support and being able to have uh, those services available to them, we will limit the um, issues that we have and the concerns that we have with infant mortality and reduce those rates in our communities. Um, we are committed. We are going to continue to move these initiatives forward, but we want to make sure that we continue to uh, make reductions and we make strides and to continue to support families um, in in making sure that the, the numbers that we see now don't continue to plague us in the future. So. I have been charged with reading our proclamation, and I want to make sure that we uh, have that opportunity to do that today. Um, I have it here before me, um, and it reads as such. 
Before the Board of County Commissioners for Multnomah County, Oregon, our proclamation September 23rd as Infant Mortality Awareness Month in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioner finds uh, the Multnomah County is committed to reducing infant mortality and improving the health outcomes of black and indigenous parents and babies through respectful community clinical practices and interventions and has formally acknowledged racism as a public health crisis. September is Infant Mortality Awareness Month, an initiative that supports and inspires people from around the nation to take action in support of the goal to improve the health and well-being of women capable of birth, infants, children, and families. Infant Mortality Awareness Month is an initiative intended to celebrate infants living beyond their first year of life. Racial inequities and infant mortality pers rates persist among black, African-American, and native indigenous communities in Multnomah County and are the result of barriers in health care, support, employment, and community settings, as well as racial ethnic discrimination within health care healthcare systems. Statistically, black African-Americans are the only ethnic group where prenatal education and income do not serve as protective factors against infant mortality. Monoma County recognizes the benefits doulas and lactation counsel counselors provide in improving birth outcomes and reducing the risk of infant mortality, significantly reducing the likelihood of preterm birth and low birth weight, all while combating the effects of racism on health during the per perinatal period, and increasing breastfeeding initiation and longevity by providing educational, physical, and emotional support during pregnancy birth and postpartum for all birthing people. Multnomah County commits to exploring how to ensure access to community-based doula lactation support for all residents regardless of insurance by building on the strengths and wisdom of our communities. Raising up needed changes to support health for babies, birthing people, and caregivers of babies, and the importance of reducing racial disparities in health care and birth outcomes for babies. National Infant Mortality Awareness Month provides op opportunities for our community to get involved and support Monoma County Health Department, Parent Child Family Health, Healthy Babies Initiatives, Future Generations Collaborative, and our partners in Monoma County. And the opportunity to encourage government agencies, community based organizations, healthcare systems, and academic institutions to work together to engage in equity efforts in our communities to eliminate disparities and overall reduce infant mortality in our county. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioner com proclaims September 23rd as Infant Mortality Awareness Month in Multnomah County, Oregon in recognition of the celebration of the importance of each child born in our community celebrating their first birthday and living healthy and rewarding lives. Adopted this day of, um, what is this, uh, September 7th, uh, 2023. Yes, it's still the seventh. Thank yeah. you so much, Chantel. I really appreciate this. I appreciate all of you. We'll go to the board for any um, quick comments. Um, we'll start with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you all so much uh, for being here. I did have, uh, before I make comments, I had some questions. Uh, I think it's on slide four, uh, where it shows uh, the percentage of uh, birth weights, preterm birth. And this is from 2019 to 2020. So which way are the numbers going? Are they going in the wrong direction? Are we making any strides? So we have begun to start making strides. Um, some of the interventions that the team has been putting into place, um, we're starting to see some improvements, but of course, uh, to Disha's point, we're looking for some continued support, some continued access. Um, I see Ms. Violet sitting in the uh, audience. Um, she has um, expanded what that looks like on the criteria for entering the programs, um, but it is, of course, the community partnerships and expanded criteria that's allowed us to be able to make some strides. Well, I, I appreciate that, and, but I'm saddened that we're not making uh, better progress uh, as a community, and clearly we, we need to do that. And it's really uh, unfortunate that education and income do not provide the protect, protective factors uh, that, that other races um, can take advantage of. Uh, some of the things I really liked about your program, uh, the, the focus on fathers, that's awesome, that's really great. 
and then also just having you know culturally specific programming uh, for the FGC and our black communities that's that's amazing and you know I think this just further supports uh, what this board has done by declaring racism as a public health crisis and clearly uh, the outcomes that you're showing us uh, support that this is a public health crisis. Uh, but I'm really excited that you're here and, and would look forward to seeing uh, how we can uh, make bigger leaps in uh, giving folks the, the services that they need uh, to make sure that all of our youth can live past one year old, you know, being a one year old. So thank you all so, so much for coming and I apologize that you had to wait so long, but I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. I thank you. Um, wow. Um, I thank you as well for just this profound um, and crucially important presentation um, and all the work that you do uh, every day. Um, as a mom and a healthcare provider, I am very passionate about this issue and um, have been aware of and I'm, I'm just horrified seeing it so starkly presented, recognize the deep disparities for black and indigenous mothers um, and recognizing that these statistics, so, you know, just starkly represented there, those represent people and um and infants and uh this is it's unacceptable um the systemic inequities uh in healthcare inequalities are too prevalent so i just want to express my deep gratitude to you and your colleagues for your work for providing these you know some of these rays of hope with the kinds of services that you provide in the way you provide them and um and your effort to to bring this to us um so we can recognize the the severity of and depth of the problem and um the opportunities and hope that you bring thank you thank you commissioner jaya paul thank you chair thank you all so much um for the presentation and the work uh, you know, a couple of things strike me. The, the numbers obviously strike me. Uh, I was going to say shocking, but they're not shocking because I think we know the impacts of racial disparities on health outcomes. I did a quick Google search to look at what the low birth weight rates worldwide are, and it's one in 10. And, I, you know, it's a random website, so I'm assuming it's accurate. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the wealthiest... <laughs> <laughs> the fact that the wealthiest country in the world has birth rates, low birth weight rates, and I just picked one of the stats, mm -hmm. um, that are on a par with the whole rest of the world, I think is an indicator of how poorly we're doing as a country. But the other thing that strikes me is the, the importance and the effectiveness of traditional practices. So, you know, I think in both of your testimony and the work that we're doing with Future Generations Collaborative, the doulas, um, that's really, really important and wonderful. And um, I think, I, I hope you know that this board is really supportive of those practices. I did wanna follow up on the Medicaid issue, so, um, or rather insurance issue. So people on private insurance have to pay a copay or, um, sorry, it's been a long morning, I'm forgetting the word, they have to pay for a service, <laughs> for, for doula service. And so what are the strategies for changing that? Is it that we would fund people who are on private insurance? Is it a legislative change? Is it a Medicaid waiver change? What's, what's the strategy? So right now there is no copay. There is no copay, there is no, no coverage at all. Um, we're hoping that there, it's a legislative change. Um, that's the issues of work. Yes, yes, a legislative change because right now it's not covered at all. And outside of getting lactation support in a the hospital, there's no um, commercial private insurance coverage for lactation support as well. So a person would have to pay that out of pocket. Um, as a doula myself, um, if someone came to me and they wanted my services, then they would pay that. Um, and you pay it one time per pregnancy, but it's fifteen hundred dollars, um, and it it that rate is contingent upon what that person charges. So. Yeah, yeah, which is prohibitive. So, um, you know, exactly. fully supportive. Prohibitive. Anything we can do to support that legislative change, please let us know. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brem Edwards. 
so this presentation, um, I'm sorry, you had to wait, um, really spoke to me um, as um, a mom of three. Um, and as somebody who um, would reside, and if I look at this chart, in one of the boxes that, um, because of my race, income, and education level, would ha be sort of in the most privileged, um, the least, one of the least likely to um, like experience an infant death or low birth weight um, child. So um, when I think about that, um, I think about, um, just as a mom, the, the, the heartache um, that comes with not being able to have your child celebrate your child's first birthday, which as a, as a mom, I think would be the, the, the ultimate um, heart, heartache and heartbreak. And so I, um, I, I love the presentation in that um, there's some really, I think, proactive, tan have been a mother, proactive, tangible things that we can do to change that. Um, the doulas and the lactation consultants. Um, and I think it's interesting that the private insurance um, market doesn't cover that because it just reminds me of many of the other things that women have had to fight for from commercial um, insurers that are not covered. Um, I think in some cases because they might be viewed as primarily um, things that uh, women would would need, and so, uh, like Commissioner Jayapal, is like sign me up to you know help advocate for those changes. Um, it used to be uh, my my mom just the other day uh, took me on her sort of memory lane of the, the day I was born, and in those days, a mom sometimes stayed in the hospital for a week or two. I mean, much longer. And now, um, my experience with my kids is like you were there for like 24 hours, and then you're home. And if you don't, I mean, having a lactation consultant and a postpartum doula, I think would make a world of difference. Um, and just no, it's not necessarily intuitive, <laughs> knowing what to do and being able to um, provide support for um, your infant child and, and help them reach that critical f first milestone. So I really applaud the work you're doing and hopefully um, changes that we can make so that more individuals have access to that and the financial barrier, um, it's not something considered like extra or um, you know, a side benefit that you might need, but really an integral part of um, a woman's overall health care that she receives. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, thank you, um, Chantel and Ashley and Daisha for all the work in here. Um, for bringing the proclamation forward today and for the really uh, both setting up like the the problem statement right? like we have work to do we have really work to do on a systemic basic level to fix this and it's also wonderful to hear about all the work that is happening to change that and I thank you for that um, it's good to hear that for the data we have where it seems we're going in the right direction we need to continue to um, reinforce and and um, support and fund the efforts that are that are making those changes and really um, again I'll join my colleagues in saying and, and lifting up this issue about these disparities because um, I think the starkest thing for me was just education income isn't protective factors for a black African American population and that's the I speak I think it speaks really clearly to the really um, kind of systemic racism we have in our medical care um, and, and how we need to all be working to change that. So just appreciate all of the work so much from us. And again, thank you for your patience and being here today. Really appreciate the chance that this board had to, um, to really still consider and lift up this issue. So thank you with that. Thank you, um, Tasia, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Myron? Uh, aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye, the proclamation is approved. Yay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So for our last item, um, I wanna bring forward an item. Um, so the, this board may act on an item that is not on the agenda notice if at least three commissioners vote in favor of a motion to immediately consider the matter. For the matter to actually be adopted, all commissioners present must vote in favor of the matter. May I have a motion to consider an item under unanimous consent? So, so moved. Second. So moved, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Jedi Paul seconds. Consideration of a unanimous consent item. The board clerk will now take. Do we need to take a roll call vote at this time? 
this is to to consider it. Okay, the board clerk will want to take a roll call vote for consideration of the matter. Commissioner Myron, aye. Commissioner Jayapal, aye. Commissioner Brim Edwards, aye. Commissioner Stegman, aye. Chair Vega Peterson, aye. Consideration of the matter is approved. UC1, budget modification number JOHS-003-24, appropriating $1.5 million for Bybee Lakes for an emergency contingency request. So moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner uh, Stegman seconds. Approval of UC1. So, um, board, this is the um, consideration of appropriating $1.5 million for Bybee Lakes for an emergency contingency request. The proposal before you today is the same as the APR that was shared with the board yesterday afternoon. No changes have been made to that document. We consider today's emergency action to provide funding for Bybee Lakes Hope Center, providing $1.5 million from county contingency funds in support for 175 shelter beds through the end of the year. Because we don't have time to wait and cannot risk the loss of a single bed in our shelter system right now. We cannot and should not continue to argue over the past. Not doing so and putting that type of method behind us has been um, one of the hallmarks of me coming into this position as chair. Instead, I want us to look forward to the future together in partnership. That is why my door has always been open because I have always believed there is a place for diversity of shelter resources as we think about how we have to respond to the homeless crisis on our street. Yet I know we have always been I, I know we have to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars, which is why the budget modification in front of you requires helping hands to meet with our CFO monthly and to provide access to their financial records for fiscal monitoring. It also requires helping hands to put together a financial recovery plan by October 20th and engage consultants to lead independent assessments of helping hands current financial and operational situation and develop recommendations for the long-term sustainability of Bybee Lake Center. We have all, I think, toured um, Bybee Lakes. I think we have all seen the good work that we do. Um, but the fact is that running a shelter inside of a vacant, um, a half vacant former jail is just expensive. It is expensive building to operate. And it might be prohibitively expensive for Bybee to operate the facility long term. But again, we cannot use the shelter bed and I wanna move forward in partnership with Bybee Lakes to find out what is the best path for moving forward successfully with, with their programs and with the service they're providing to the people of Multnomah County. Multnomah County needs to move people inside with urgency to potentially even help to expand the capacity at Bybee Lakes Hope Center. And today's motion helps us to do this. The beds at Bybee Lakes should be available to our community and we are united in making sure this happens. Our contract will stipulate that Bybee increases its occupancy rate in the coming months after halting intakes last month. Their goal is to get back to 80% occupancy within two months and 92% occupancy in three months. It is my understanding that Bybee is confident that they will meet those, ben that they will meet those benchmarks and likely exceed them. From here, I look forward to continuing to work with the Bybee Lakes Hope Center leadership to assess the organization's financial and operational situation with the hope that together we can continue supporting those living unsheltered in our community. I wanna thank all of the many, many community advocates who reached out over the past weeks to express your thoughts, concerns, and support, and to every member of this board for your partnership in considering and moving towards consensus on this short-term investment to maintain shelter capacity. Now I'd like to welcome Mike Davis, CEO of Helping Hands, to testify first on this issue and answer any questions from this board. Good afternoon, Mike, thank you for being here. Thank you. Do I have just two minutes or more? Uh, you can, you have three. I, you I, have, you, let's do, let's aim for three and see how we go. Okay, perfect. <laughs> but, but you'll be able to answer the board's question, so it's a little bit different. Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Commissioners. My name is Mike Davis. I'm CEO of Helping Hands Reentry Outreach Centers. We operate 10 other facilities in Oregon, but today I'm here representing uh, the participants that call Bybee Lakes Hope Center their home and the 30 employees that are uh, there to support them. I want to first thank the chair and the commissioners for uh, taking the time to learn about us, to come out and take tours, to understand our program and how we do things. Um, I think it's very important. Um, and I also want to thank you all for taking the time for working with us and working together to come up with a solution to help us in this near term. 
I do want to clear up some misconceptions, though, while I'm here. Um, we have always offered emergency shelter. Uh, that's the entryway into our long-term program. It is 30 days. Uh, in that uh, emergency shelter, we offer navigation services for people. Navigation services are designed to help figure out a way to divert people from going back to the street. We at Bybee Lakes, since January of this year through August of this year, have diverted 75% of the people that have come through our doors from going back to the streets. Uh, in that same time frame, we've helped 2,007 people in our building. Um, also, uh, to address the comment that you had about it's too expensive to operate in that facility, we've been taking the efforts to decrease the cost. It's expensive to uh, power a 155,000 square foot building. And so we've worked to apply for Portland Clean Energy Fund grants to be able to help mitigate those costs by putting solar panels across 155,000 400 square feet. We've also worked to replace our chiller system, which is outdated and inefficient. Um, and we'll see uh, uh, reduced costs based off of those things as well. And so we're taking the steps to reduce those costs, but we need time. Because the system out there of applying for grants and being able to work to get <coughs> the funds that we need to do those capital projects takes time. So I thank you for considering giving us some more time. Once we reopen to intakes, our wait list right now has 96 people on it. We've got 19 mothers. We have one father. We have 45 children on that list that will work to get into that building as quickly as we possibly can. It'll take us a little bit of time because there is a process to bring people in, but we will work through that process as quickly as we can and get these people off the street that have been waiting. I do wanna share a little bit about the people that we do serve there because you know I know as we have conversations and we talk about beds and we talk about buildings the investment in the people gets lost sometimes and so let me share a couple of the people that we're helping at Bybee Lakes 81 years old veteran nurse has always been housed has not had a problem but was scammed didn't learn about it until they received a letter from their landlord evicting them and asking for $30,000. That's the kind of people that we're helping at Bybee Lakes. A mother with two young daughters, she's young herself. She looked me in the face and said, I am here because I wanna break this cycle for my daughters. Those are the people that we're trying to help. You know, when folks come into our building um, one of the first questions we ask is, do you have health insurance? And if, we, if the answer is no, we get them on OHP. We work really hard to do this, and we work really hard to get them initial medical evaluations done. When they go into our longer-term program, they have opportunities to be able to work on those chronic um, health concerns that they have that they've never been able to address on the street. One of the people who came in had hep C, went through all the treatment of going through that, and then it was found out they had cancer as well. They got to spend the entire time going through all their treatments at Bybee Lakes Health Center while continuing to do the program to ensure that when they do leave our building that they will be successful in sustainable housing. Part of our program is to ensure that people have the basic life skills that they may have lost or never have been taught so that way they can be successful when they're uh, um, leaving our facility and going into uh, sustainable housing. So, I do want to thank the, the community that has reached out on our behalf. I've heard thousands of people have written in, called, testified, and we appreciate that support. And I'd like to thank the chair once again and the commissioners um, for recognizing the vital services that Bybee Lakes Hope Center provides here in Multnomah County and working with us to start creating a partnership because that's what we would like to see is a partnership between us where we can work together. So again, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you so much. We'll go to the board to see if any folks have questions. Um, we'll start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to commend Alan Evans, uh, Jordan Schnitzer, Helping Hands, and your board for coming to our community's aid years ago by opening the Bybee Lakes Hope Center. 
It's a data-driven transitional housing facility that has served with shelter uh, that has served thousands of people experiencing homelessness to date. Despite never receiving county funding and despite the many naysayers and skeptics who um, were in the county itself, we on this board, myself, the community owe you a tremendous amount of gratitude, so thank you. Um, Bybee likes, my understanding is you asked for two sort of tiers of funding months ago, the more emergent funding to keep that would be needed to keep your doors open and ongoing funding. Um, I look forward to a third tier. You've also mentioned some serious innovation that I think could be accomplished in our partnership. So that will be exciting to consider. Um, but uh, you know what, what I, I do want to speak to the process of how this came about that we're sort of voting on this at literally the very last minute to get this funding for you. Um, and I know the chair in uh, her introduction said we don't have time to wait, but you know I, I believe the chair's office has known about this need for months and um, has had plenty of time to get information, negotiate and invest in advance proactively at the very least in the emergent needs of the facility. So you wouldn't have to for months face this potential cliff and the potential of closure. Rather than respond for the first time or to do things so that we could avoid that stress, including on the thousands of the over a thousand constituents who did write into us, um, which I so appreciated. It was at a meeting just like a, I think a week or a week and a couple of days ago, the chair proposed an investment for the emergency funding that I think had, had already been rejected by Bybee Lakes. And only then, when I imagine that was maybe brought to the office's attention, were there what sounded like some, some real negotiations. It, it has felt like the process has been unnecessarily protracted. And again, only at the literal last minute today um, are we at a place where this board could actually vote to support, which I have been planning to do all along, um, something that could have been done months ago. So I apologize for the, the stress and frustration that I imagine has been felt by so many, but the bottom line moving forward is, are we gonna be able to do this in time? I certainly hope so today. <laughs> um, I fully support allocating this $1.5 million to maintain services at Bybee Lakes in the short term, and we shouldn't stop there. I will continue to advocate for additional funding for Bybee Lakes over the coming weeks as we decide how to spend tens of millions of dollars of unanticipated SHS measure revenue. Um, I support having a potential third party organizational assessment of Bybee Lakes. As I mentioned in my remarks for the um, the cap earlier, I actually think this should be done with all of our providers who contract with the Joint Office of Homeless Services. And hopefully we will get to a place where we have that kind of uh, due diligence with all our uh, organizational partners. Um, most organizations probably don't have the resources to hire a consultant, I mentioned this earlier, uh, to do that organizational assessment, which could help identify efficiencies, strategies to retain workforce and improve service delivery, et cetera. The county can, and I believe we should pay for these assessments, as this can also guide us in making strategic investments. I look so forward to our partnership um, and as noted, I will be voting yes. Thank you. Commissioner Darapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, since I got the order wrong last time, let me just clarify, are we doing questions and comments now or just questions? Because I have both. Okay. Um, do we have any people signed up for public testimony? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to make sure they're still here though? Well, let's just do questions then for right okay. now. Okay. Um, 
Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Mike, for being here. Thank you. I know you spent time with my team answering some of my questions. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I do have a couple of additional questions. One has one, one's for you and one's for our staff. So I'll start with the one for you. Um, you know, in the original or the August 7th request that we received from Helping Hands, it specified an ask. There was a $3 million ask, I think, probably for capital, but then there was one, one sorry, let me put my glasses back on. Um, there was an ask for 500000 per quarter for operating funds, was what I understood. So the chair's proposal, and I don't know, maybe this is a question for you, Chair. The chair's proposal today is $1.5 million over four months, which is 375,000 a month versus the 167 that would that the 500 would have translated to. Can can someone explain the difference? Because it's it seems that what we're voting on today is roughly double what the ask was. So we had put a proposal before um, to um, by B Lakes, estimating what about 75 percent of their operating um, funds would be. Um, with the with the hope that they would be able to find other funding sources for the for the last 20 percent 25 percent I think in further discussions that we had with Bybee Lakes about this it, it was really like they needed the the 1.5 million to be able to continue operations through December um, and in during that time we would be doing uh, like you know the additional work on looking at um, the financial and management operations and long-term sustainability of the organization um, but it was really just you know kind of like we were trying to do the best, the best guess of what it could it could potentially look like for for us to support them, and really in further conversations, we just had a better picture of what they needed. So just to clarify, and maybe now I'll turn you back to you, Mike. For me, yeah. yeah, I do. So the, the original letter, the August seventh letter, yeah. asked for five hundred thousand dollars per quarter. Was there something that changed between the time of that letter and today that the ask is now for one point five million? per four months? So uh, the change came about because there were concerns uh, that we've heard at different uh, county meetings that there has not been time to talk it out uh, with the larger proposal. Um, and while we didn't have the luxury of being able to wait for multiple workshops for that to happen, we had to look at, okay, what can we do to ensure that we could keep our doors open through the end of this year? Right, but when you sent us the request in August, that was $500,000 per quarter. And this is now 1.5 million for four months. So it's on, on a monthly basis, what we're funding today is double what you had asked for in August. Well, there's also $3 million up front. That was a one-time fee, and then the $500,000 a quarter. So there was some money up front so we could get hold on our bills as well as have the ability to pay for operations as we continued on. There are things that happen at an organization when um, you get into this emergent situation where hiring freezes. So we are short staff uh, people in development that would help us build out the capability and capacity to be able to do this fundraising. I also believe that as part of this investment that the county is making, a lot of the major donors that are paying the SHS tax that have told us we're not donating to you because we pay this tax will work with us once again. And so we'll be able to bring in additional donations as well um, from that. And so we do see that we need this kickstart to get going, but long-term sustainability is our ultimate end goal. I, I really appreciate that, and you know, again, I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate the fact that you've had a, a drop in those private donations. So I'm, I'm not really asking about that. I'm asking about the cost of operations, and maybe what I heard you say is that this 1.5 million isn't just for the ongoing cost of operating the facility, which is, you know, that would be the 500,000 per quarter that you had identified in August, but that the 1.5 million is maybe covering um, liabilities that exist on top of the ongoing operating costs? Yes, we do have some liabilities that we have to take care of. Um, so that way we can get whole as an organization. So that way we can continue to move forward. Okay, so uh, the, the 1.5 million then is both existing liabilities and ongoing operating costs for the four months left till the end of the year. Yeah, it's, I mean, it was basically everything needed to keep their doors open through December 31st. And keep the power on and keep the water going. Yep, okay, okay. thank you, I think I understand that. And then a question for Christian. Um, 
I think the proposal is that we take this funding from contingency. So just want to circle back to understand. Uh, so the proposal is we take it from contingency and then we backfill with unanticipated revenue, although we'll still have to vote on that. So I want to understand what's left in contingency. That would leave, um, sorry, for the record, Christian Elkin, budget director, I use she, her pronouns. Um, so what that would leave in contingency is just roughly around $350,000. I usually have a, spread, a spreadsheet for that and I didn't bring it up here with me, my apologies. So in the contingency for uncertainty, we started with just above 2.2 million. So after the actions that we took last week, and then this proposal today, it would leave about roughly $350,000 in that allocation. And then we still have our general fund contingency, the $2 million, our routine contingency that we keep for all of our unanticipated emergencies. Thank you. Um, those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Jarapal. Um, Commissioner Burma Edwards. Great. I've got three questions. I have comments, but we're going to do this later. So um, I have actually two, two questions. Um, for you and one for the chair. Uh, first, uh, the um, with the stabilization, say, say um, you all have the, the funding that's to stabilize your operations. Um, these are these are more forward-looking questions. You have funding to stabilize your operations. You actually have capacity, based on our previous discussions that we've had, to actually expand what you could do beyond what you currently are doing. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is a bet in some ways, not only on the, what we currently have, but also on the future um, of the poten future potential. And then um, your lease ends on April 2025. And in terms of a longer term in investment uh, moving forward, maybe could, could you speak to what the planning is? I mean, when I think about mat sort of matching investments, especially if they're capital investments with um, sort of the, the term of the life of the capital investments with um, if, if the county were to make uh, other investments at Bybee Lakes. Um, how are you approaching sort of and thinking about potentially matching investments that are made with the current ending um, termination of the lease at um, April of 2025? Um, so if I could first go back to your capacity question. So the chair mentioned we had 175 beds, and that's the target we're utilizing for these uh, uh, dollars that we're talking about today. We actually have over 300 beds um, up and built and available at Bybee Lakes. Um, but there's additional cost for us to be able to run those additional beds. So that's our target of growth as we're going forward. We also sit on 17 acres, and uh, Commissioner Bram Edwards has talked before about um, putting some of these tiny homes out there. And so, you know, once we shore up what we're doing at Bybee Lakes, we definitely want to have conversations about how we can expand those uh, uh, um, capacity at Bybee Lakes itself. Um, that's a conversation that would be in partnership with Schnitzer Properties, who is currently the, the leaseholder for us. Um, so they would be a part of that, because any change we make to the building, we have to talk with Schnitzer Properties first. Um, as far as your... Um, uh, uh, second question, and can I'm sorry, can you remind me? Yes. A funder should think about capital investments that the investments, the life of the investment extends beyond what your current lease is. Um, so we're in constant communication with Schnitzer Properties and with Jordan himself about the property itself. I have no doubt that a lease renewal. At, will at least be on the table. If Jordan has other ideas of what he wants to be able to do, I can't share those publicly. That would be for him to be able to share. Um, so that's, we expect to be in this building for a very long time. Our organization has been in operations over 20 years. Um, we've been providing these services across multiple counties and we're working it out here. And it takes a little bit of time to go through the growing pains that we're going through. Um, but. When we're up and running and 318 people are living in that facility and going through the program and uh, having access to daycare so they can get employment, uh, getting mental health help and substance use disorder treatments on site, um, getting classes for basic life skills like financial literacy, all of those things happen right there on site. And so it's a vital resource. We need to keep that going. No, 
No, there's a total of 318 beds there. They're built out, yes. They're built out, their linens, everything. Excuse me, sorry, Commissioner Edwards, is your um, mic on? No, it is not. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for calling that out. Do you need to? Do I need to repeat the question or? No. Good? Okay. Um, Thank you for the information. So we have potential of another 125 plus another additional um, potential outside if that's negotiated. And I guess the last question I have, and this is more of a timing issue, because I know organizations when you start um, contracting, so like taking in no more. Um, individuals like there there is a cost um to like starting a shutdown or a slowdown and then to restart again and i'm um i'm optimistic we're going to be moving with speed this fall but i'm i'm curious about the december date um of like how the four months got picked um previously there had been um a whole host of other conversations with longer timelines so with the four months um of what I consider bridge funding, but ending in December in the middle of winter, I'm curious, is, are, are we going to, um, we'll have an opportunity with unanticipated revenue potentially to talk about the, the longer term and that would be the point in time if we were gonna do something beyond December 31st? So I think it's one, to have time to do the um, financial and management um, third party evaluation on, on the functionings of Bybee Lakes. To further um, the conversations that are happening right now about the about the the use of the site, what's what's capable there, um, what the capacity is, and um, to have uh, Bybee Lakes to give Bybee Lakes the opportunity to apply for some of the um, RFPs and, and contract availability with the joint office to become a um, a funded partner, a funded. Um, um, organization through the Joint Office of Homeless Services to, to get the funding stream through that mechanism, the more traditional mechanisms of how we fund organizations. And we're, are we confident that that, that whole process can happen? Um, I'm completely supportive of the financial yeah. evaluation, uh, but that that whole process could happen within that again. So to heading people off, you know, heading off a cliff at the end of um, December in the winter, I guess I want to just want to assure so that we think that we that would that we have adequate time to do that process. Yeah. Without yes. without saying what the outcome is, but like that we'd have actually the timing would not be the barrier. Yes. I mean that's been part of the conversations that we've been having about this engaging with um, you know the departments and, and specifically the Joint Office of Homeless Services in terms of what the what the um, possibilities are for the next several months. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mike, for being here, and thank you for forwarding the lease. I, I appreciate that. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify, so this money would just, would fund, not just, but would fund, continue to fund 175 beds, not the full 318, is that? Correct, and uh, the Chair mentioned the ramp up to that, um, and we expect we'll meet that with no problem. But would that ramp up occur within this year, or are we seeing? The, the ramp up to the 175 beds. Oh, to the 175. Yes, and there are 30 day, 60 day, 90 day benchmarks that we need to meet. Um, and with the wait list that I shared with you, that's gonna more than meet. The right, need. okay, and so hopefully we'll have an opportunity because you have capacity for 318 is what yes. you're saying. Yes. Okay, so uh, we can have further conversation about that. Uh, and I'm also curious, uh, just to put on your radar, is that I, you know, as we look at this unanticipated funding and looking at your lease uh, and, you know, appreciate uh, Jordan Schnitzer and the commitment he's made, but uh, would also, would, I don't know what that looks like, to have some kind of assurance that if we do make larger, longer term investments, uh, you know, how we can be assured that, that your lease will continue so w I don't know if you can answer that now or later but that would obviously be something that I would want to know yeah no I, I understand your concern with that and definitely I'll carry that forward as I meet with them on a regular basis um, so we can talk through that and decide how we want to uh, um, uh, respond to you great thank you and it looks like so October 20th is when is that when you're supposed to be re reporting back to us on the financial recovery plan is that correct 
Sorry, can you repeat that? I, I thought I saw somewhere that October 20th was when a financial recovery plan was due. Is yes, that's exactly right. So what, what you're saying is that um, by the lakes that you will, you will be reporting back to us on what your financial recovery plan is on October 20th? Yes, and, we'll, and we are supposed to receive that. I, I think like the, um, our financial, you know, Eric Ariano and, and our, my office, and so we can, we can okay. show that after we Great. receive it. Great, and how soon, uh, so I know that you have uh, shut down your intakes, hopefully you can restart. Like, is it just a flip of a button? How, how long does that take you to start opening the intake again? Um, so we did open our intakes in our rural communities when uh, the governor and Columbia Pacific CCO stepped up with some funding for us. Um, and so we were able to start up very fairly quickly. I'll need to meet with the staff there. Um, I haven't had opportunity to talk with uh, our facility director um, at that location about that because I needed to see what the outcome of this meeting was um, because I cannot provide false hope to those people um, that work there and that are participants in our building. Okay, so would you say, but we would hope within weeks? Yes. Great, okay, that's great. Um, and then I guess maybe if you could speak overall, I'm not sure, you know, and once we, you know, have the financial recovery plan, but I'm not, can you speak to how uh, you, you are in this financial position, how you got to this place of having to shut down? Uh, and I just kind of wanted an overall understanding of, of how we got to this point. Sure. Um, since Bybee Lakes opened um, in 2021, we were awarded uh, a navigation center status. We were one of eight in the state, and so we received funding from uh, the state in the form of $2 million, and then 2022, we received $1.4 million for our services provided uh, as a nav navigation center in the city of Portland. Um, with the change in the governor's uh, directive, um, uh, on homelessness in the state of Oregon. That pot of money has been expanded to a lot more organizations, and so we expect that we will receive about two, maybe $300,000 out of that pot of money. Um, we have yet to be told what we'll receive at this point in time. Um, we also uh, last year received one-time ARPA funding from the city of Portland, um, and we did make a request there, but we have uh, not received any funds in that manner as well. Um, and then also with the opening of Bybee Lakes in October of 2020, we had um, major funders that were buzzing to be a part of opening um, with six-figure donations towards capital, towards operations once we were opened up. Um, but we hear from them that this SHS tax is really hitting them and that's where their investment uh, is going for homelessness is through that tax. And so um, it's kind of a, a triple whammy that we're getting hit with, um, you know, with the state of emergency, um, with one-time funding, and then with uh, the SHS tax. Great, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. That gives, a, gives us a larger view of what's happening. Uh, and I, uh, I have toured your facility and uh, think that you all are doing really great work and I'm very pleased. Uh, that this board can hopefully step in uh, and preserve those 175 beds and even expand to the 318 as soon as possible. So thank you for being here. Thank you, and we do have a tour coming up soon, so I'll see you soon. We do. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, and um, we're going to go ahead and open it for public testimony right thank at you. this time. We have three people signed up for public testimony, America Vicente, Eric Cole, and Susie Kushner. Kirshner? Great, and let's keep, um, let's have two minutes for public testimony, thank you. Good morning. Hi, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, yeah. You're can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Should I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, good afternoon, my name is America Grau. I'm an economist by training. My work with a multilateral financial institution allows me to be exposed to multiple countries and situations, especially in developing countries and with colleagues in fragile and conflict settings. As discussed today, we are facing a humanitarian crisis in Portland. Unfortunately, many people cannot function on their own without supervision, and many are living outside on the street. Additionally, 
many of them are falling into addictions, providing a great business opportunity for drug traders that are operating in the illicit economy and are not taxed or regulated. I am really grateful that you are supporting Bybee Lakes by providing them funding and support to ensure their financial processes align with public sector guidelines. I believe that you should also look at ways to replicate models that can reach economies of scales for shelters in a similar setup as Bybee Lakes. Based on my observations, very few organizations are able to take people out from the streets more sustainably. Based on my experience, operations across all providers need to be data-driven, goals need to be quantified, and results-based financing methodologies implemented. It didn't look like the plan you presented for Multnomah County takes these factors into account. Lastly, I learned that members of Multnomah County are going to be visiting Portugal as part of Measure 110. I'm Spanish and Portugal is our neighborhood. Um, as it happens, both Portugal and Spain went through deep prison and mental health care reforms. Thank you. You should learn in Portugal more about them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the commission, for having me and letting me speak to you again. I'm Eric Cole. I'm with the Revitalized Portland Coalition. I use he, him pronouns. And uh, really, as an industry and as Portlanders, I think we all share the same goals, which is to see our region thrive again. Um, I am here in support of this emergency resolution. Um, our, our, we've, uh, we have supported Bobby Lake since from the very beginning and are very supportive of their efforts going forward. Uh, Commissioner Jayapal called this an emergency. Um, it, it, we agree with all of you that it's time to treat it as an emergency. Um, I wanted to make a couple points. You've heard a lot of context this morning, but two things that didn't get brought up earlier. As we heard yesterday at the City Council in Portland, we've seen a major uptick in violent and property crimes in the last four weeks. Uh, you can hear and see the patients wearing thin on the business owners, the residents, and the neighbors downtown. And um, it's been quite palpable in the last two weeks, so it is an urgent situation. Um, we've also been hearing from some of our top employers in the area who are expressing that their employees really do want to return to the office more days a week. What's preventing that, however, is their, their employees are not able to walk, commute, bike, commute uh, to the office the way they used to. They're not able to go out and lunch the way they used to. I give you those contexts because it's important with all how these issues are all connected and with the amount of taxpayer dollars that Multnomah County is entrusted with and your mission to protect public health and well-being, we think you hold a great bit of responsibility along with the other jurisdictions in turning the crisis around and that these funds, this opportunity with Bybee Lakes is an opportunity for the board to change some of that dynamic and address this crisis head on. Uh, Bybee checks so many boxes of what we need in the community and just really encourage you uh, to support it. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Susie, are you still here? Oh, there she is. Good morning, Chair. or good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, yes. Uh, and thank you, uh, Chair and Commissioners, for the opportunity to tag on to that, which I didn't complete. But it's sort of, I wanted to sit through this because um, I appreciate, I truly do, uh, being what I said earlier, I appreciate the time that you are dedicating. And where there is a multi-layered solution, what I have heard today are so many of the solutions that people are carrying with good heart and good anecdotal stories. Um, so I'd like to sort of summarize by mapping the positive and that instead of just when we shift to a more positive focus, we shift away from houselessness and hopelessness to think to considering homing and creating that nurture, nurturing nest that all of these holistic comprehensive programs can do. So I think language is important as we, as we move forward in mapping the positive of this story. And that we, uh, 
we shift our thoughts uh, to consider those things that we understand about addiction is that which happens to us when we self-medicate. And so when to pick up on the, the lessons learned possibly from Portugal, there are some powerful lessons. One of the things that I've have been sort of disconcerted to hear is that, well, it hasn't worked. Well, that's because programming was withdrawn. So to me, the cautionary tale of looking to that model of system is that we build this out over time and that we do. We look at that continuum of care, that sustainability. And at the heart of that is the understanding of why do we self-medicate, also understanding the neurodiversity behind uh, challenges to behavioral health and, and mental health, who are our people, uh, I'd like to lift up my hands right now and looking at you, Sharon, right now in uh, saying thank you for the support that you and the board has given through our previous proclamation for FASD Awareness Month, and that's where we are right now. And again, just thank you, but center it on the children and the families for the future generations, you. because you, Commissioner, uh, as a commissioner, championed the rights of our children around co-location. And so I'm hoping thank when you. you have your board retreat, you bring this all together and uh, bring you. it to our families thank you in that much. way. Thank you. Is that all the public comments? Wonderful. We'll go to the board for final comments, and we'll start with Commissioner uh, Commissioner Myron. Did you have any further? You, I think you made your comments at the beginning. I I did. Um, just I have just a couple more, which um, I I just really appreciated. The it was uh, okay. I always so appreciate gonna, public have, testimony, but the those um, last three um, uh, speakers really just all had something so important and powerful to add to the conversation. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who has been advocating and weighing in and um, really, it has really made a difference and uh, <clears throat> goes to the really the heart and soul of this work. So, so um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dowell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I too want to start with my thanks, um, really, to everybody who's testified here today, but also to the many, many, many people who've written in about this funding. Um, and I want to let you know that the degree of support that you've expressed has had an impact. So thank you. I do support the proposed approach of providing bridge funding while we do our due diligence into management operations and I think it's kind of sustainability of the overall model of Helping Hands and Bybee Lakes. I support it because, based on my understanding of the programming that's provided at Bybee Lakes, it fills a really important gap in our shelter to housing continuum, which is a need for both emergency shelter, which I know is what we're funding now, but also transitional or stabilization shelter and housing. That gap is one of the priorities that I specifically identified in my list of proposed investments for unanticipated SHS revenue. So I support this approach. Um, and I support additional investment in the kind of programming that I understand Bybee Lakes to provide, but I think there are questions about the financial model operations and we need to do our due dil diligence. A Couple of things that rise to the top for me are first, um, as the chair also alluded to, whether the cost of running shelter at that facility is simply too high and whether that's part of the reason that we're in the situation that it's in. Um, we'd need to compare costs to other facilities to know the answer, but that facility's cost number does jump out of the financials that we were provided. And then second, I think we need to better understand whether Helping Hands can eventually develop other revenue streams, as most of our providers have to do, and how long that will take and what it will take, or whether we're really talking about the county taking on fully funding the organization on an ongoing basis, and that is a very significant lift and very significant ask. Um, and we would, I think, come back to the question of whether the overall cost structure in this particular facility makes sense. So we need to do our due diligence on those and other issues. I'm confident that some of the columnists who are urging us to fund the program would also really call us out if we did not do our due diligence and problems emerged. Um, I appreciate Bybee Lakes and the information that you've provided. I think doing an external review in this case does make sense, even though we usually do internal reviews of this kind um, all, all the time and regularly for other providers. Um, and I think with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brim Edwards. Thank you. Um, I'm excited we're voting on this this morning, even if it's uh, in, in the, at the 
I feel like at the very last moment. Um, and I'm excited to vote for it um, because I've uh, visited Bybee Lakes and talked to the people who have received support for there. And um, when I think about all the different shelter options and housing options and tra transitional housing and the housing models, um, there's different models for different people. And I think it's important that we recognize that, that there's not one size fits all. It, there used to be a heavy reliance on just um, a, a particular shelter model, and I think we are recognizing that um, there's different needs for different communities and different types of supports people need on their journey from the streets to um, permanent housing. And I think today's action um, s speaks to that. Um, also, I want to just note that I've had an opportunity to talk to staff at, the, at Fabian K-8, which is the nearest elementary school um, to uh, Bybee Lakes, and the fact that uh, families with children, um, with elementary school children, um, can have their children even in a state of what would be considered an, like a somewhat unstable situation, that they have the stability of being able to go to the same um, elementary um, school every day and uh, be school kids like everybody else is, um, I think, another really unique feature of um, Bybee Lakes. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to be supportive. And when we put the, our proposals forward for the unanticipated homeless services revenue, taking urgent action on more shelter space to reduce un both unsanctioned camping and to ensure that individuals have shelter with basic services like bathrooms, showers, and safety was at the top of my list. Um, and as I, I think about it today, we've already taken action on um, the city's uh, shelter sites or a portion of that. Um, we're gonna have an opportunity, I think, to discuss micro villages and other um, supports for other, our longtime uh, shelter providers. And today we're looking at a uh, potential for the bridge funding for Bybee Lakes. In my initial proposal, I propose funds for 500 additional shelter beds and to retain current shelter beds and specifically called out retaining the 175 shelter beds at Bybee Lakes and funding a potential expansion there. Um, again, this is sort of a bet both on, our, on the current state but also a potential opportunity in the, in the future. Um, this investment provides a shorter term uh, bridge than um, I, I would, I would have hoped for, um, but I think it isn't. It's a very important bridge because I do think we, it allows us. Um, we can't we can't afford to lose any shelter beds. So I really appreciate that we have an opportunity to retain those 175, and um, that it also gives us um, us as a commission a bridge to the future to have that future discussion as we move to the next batch of investments, which we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks, um, I will be advancing uh, more funding for Bybee Lakes because I believe we do need to make continue to make investments in a whole variety of different um, shelter and housing options, and Bybee Lakes should be in, in the mix. Um, and as other commissioners also explained and, and shared, um, having the um, understanding of financials, doing our due diligence will be really an important component of that. And we're gonna need an answer on, um, uh, from at least my perspective, on the lease aspect and the, and the terms of the lease um, so that um, as we make a longer, if we're make, going to be making a longer term investment, whether it's through the RFP process or some other way that we also um, really understand um, the, what the return on the investment would be because um, April 25th is gonna roll around before we know it, and understanding that and what the terms are, I think will also give us a much better understanding of the uh, Bybee Lakes uh, financial future and whether they can accommodate actually an expansion or this is just a retention of current beds. Um, so I'm an, an enthusiastic yes because, and like I say, coupled with the earlier action on the temporary alternative shelter sites, um, this morning we're making um, I think potential both on retention of shelter beds, but also um, new shelter beds, which is good for our community. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am very pleased to support this one and a half million dollars to Bybee Lakes because quite simply it's the right thing to do. 
it will give us the opportunity to preserve and potentially expand additional beds and it will give us the needed time that we need to determine our long-term investments and complete our due diligence. So uh, I am very supportive of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. May we have a role? Well, I will just say I'm very supportive of this. That is <laughs> um, why that um, we have been engaged in this process. And I look forward to the continued work partnership and um, sharing of information so that we can um, see how we can support um, the work at Bybee Lakes and, the, and, and um, you know, have that relationship going forward with the county. Um, so can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Brim Edwards? Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Vega Peterson? Aye. The, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm saying it the right way. The budget modification is approved. Thank you. All right. Um, yes, very good. Um, thank you so much. So at this point, I'd like to, um, I'd like to reopen R1 to allow Commissioner Myron to vote on the matter um, to be entered in the record. So can I get a motion to reopen and a second? So moved. Second. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Commissioner Myron, how do you vote on R1? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, my vote is no. Great, thank you so much for that we were able to get that into the record. Um, all right, well, that was a marathon session. I just really appreciate the work of the board, but everybody's sticking through this, including so many people in our audience for that. Um, I would like to go ahead and um, I know me, some people may have to leave, and so if you do, or you, if you need to leave at this point, just wanted to open up if anyone had any um, board comments today. Nope, nope, nope. Okay, looks like we that. Then with that, we are adjourned. We'll see you next Tuesday.